Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate, back here on the Lights Out podcast, and that's the MMA detective, Mike Davis. We're off on another deep dive. This is what we do. And uh, we're in classic territory again, Michael. Michael, we are we are in one of those pioneer modes as we have been joined by Lions Den, you know, possibly the co-founder. We're going to find out. But this man was there at the very beginning of the Lions Den, and we got Vernon Tiger White joining us. How you doing, Vernon? I'm doing great. How about you? Really glad to have you on here. I'm going to let Mike take over. So, Vernon, your career – Okay, our podcast concentrates on underappreciated fighters. And when you look at your career, it's mind-boggling how many historic events, like at their at their beginnings, that you were either a part of or, you know, fighting or in the locker room. So we're only going to concentrate on your pancreas career. Like, we're not going further than that. And there's so much. I, I literally got eight pages of notes just on what I've taken only on Pancrase and the Lions Den. It's okay. it's truly incredible how many social circles that you've kind of worked your way into. Yeah, I feel like on that uh, that guy that was in the background, someone always, this one guy said to me, you know what, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have stayed in the Lions Den. And um, he said, you held us together. And I'm like, yeah, you can. I guess you could say I'm like the the, the crust around the bread that holds the bread together. <laughs> um, let's start from the beginning. You come from a Taekwondo background. Am I correct? I uh, actually trained Taekwondo, Kaja Kimbo, and Adori Kumo. Okay. How do, you, how do you meet, like, how do you get involved with the Lions, Dan? And, and at what point do you, do you join them? So, um, I was living in Angel's Camp in, in a weird, I was in a weird place in my life. I had, uh, I had just lost my, uh, uh, my home because I got kicked out by my grandfather. So um, then he ended up passing away. So I moved with this, it, she was my ex like substitute teacher and she lived up in Angel's Camp, right. So I was staying with her and her daughter, and um, I'm surprised that they allowed me to stay. And um, I was there for a little bit, and then um, I met this guy. His name was Papa John. So Papa John had a boys' home, and he was friends with Bob Shamrock, who had a boys' home. So Papa John had some videos, and, he's, and he showed me these videos of a bunch of Japanese dudes, and then there's Ken. So at first he was like, yeah, how would you like to go to Japan? And I'm like, I'm afraid to fly, dude. I'm not going to Japan. And uh, then he told me how much money I could make. And um, I was like, okay, I'll check it out. <laughs> you got to open that if you're quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Would you, would you mind sharing with us how much it was? Because I'll tell you, you know, Chris, who does this podcast with us, he started out in Pancras and – by the time they got to him a couple of, you know, later, he was getting 1200 bucks. I'm hoping you were doing better than that. Nope. That's exactly what I was doing. Okay, good. So okay, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's just rewind a little bit. You, they want you to make you a name for yourself, and then they want to give you money. Let me rewind a little bit. You had mentioned a boy's home. Did you have a troubled childhood? Um, yeah, but I was never, I was never in the system. So um, my troubled childhood, long story, uh, won't be getting into it, but I will say after my grandfather, my mom, they both died within two weeks of each other, and my girlfriend tried to commit suicide. That was a dark time in my life, and I went off the deep end, and um, thank God I found fighting, because um, had I not found fighting, who knows where I'd be. And this is the early 20s for you. You were a young man, right? Or is it yeah. earlier than that? Yeah, 20s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I start, my first fight was in 1990. 
four? Three. Ninety three. Ninety uh April seventh, nineteen ninety three. Okay. No, I got I got September twenty first, nineteen ninety three in Japan, unless there's something prior to that. I think uh my first fight was NK Tokyo Bay NK Hall. And that was with is that Suzuki? I, I got Suzuki. Fuke. I got Takaku Fuke. Oh Fuke. Okay. So Fuke, then Suzuki, then Inagaki. Okay. Well, well, well he, he, here, this is, we had Galindo on, obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you, you heard that interview, and we've also had Scott Bissack, and the one underlying thing that those guys repeat to us is Tiger was the man, like Tiger kept everybody together, he was just such a smooth, easygoing guy, but before his first fight, Ken actually kicked him out of the lion's den, and I think it was Funaki took you in. Is there, is there any truth to that? So, yeah, Ken got mad at me. Um, I had an attitude. Uh, um, I remember I was wearing my little Malcolm X stuff and my little Africa symbol. And Yeah, Ken got upset with me. And then um, Funaki decided to bring me to Japan for two and a half months. And, um, yeah, I stayed in the uh, Young Boys Dojo. But... I didn't go by their rules um, because, yeah, these guys got beat up. I'm like, yeah, you ain't putting your hands on me like that. I will fight back and like nobody you've ever seen before in your life. So, so is this before your first fight that happened? Um, I was not kicked out before my first fight. I got sent there. It had to be probably about a, a year, six months to a year after I started is when Ken sent me there. But yeah, I have that. I was just gonna ask. So the videos you saw of Ken and all these Japanese guys, how long do you figure Ken has been going over there? And do you know how that was set up? Like, how was he? How did he get involved with that? Uh, he was with Fujiwara Gumi, and uh, Fujiwara Gumi, um, he was kind of like their hitman. So if someone ever came over and uh, they had a bad attitude, they they'd uh, give them to Ken, and Ken would put him in their place. Wow. So, yeah. So so he got that habit early, huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you're a henchman and you know no one can beat you, I mean, yeah, you kind of get a chip on your shoulder. Okay. You had mentioned you know, I, about, about well, when we get this in, we go, about living like, with the young boys. There's a picture in, in the dojo. We, we've had a couple people talk about it. Jason DeLucia, Chris Lytos talked about it about a couple of young boys that had died. Could you yeah. shed some light on that story? Okay, I know one young boy who died. Um, another one, he, he suffered a brain injury. He's still alive. They turned him into a, a referee. So they didn't like hurt him and then kick him out. So, you know, they had, they kept him there and used him. But yeah, another kid who died I think he died. I think it was Suzuki who accidentally killed him. Um, I think it was his neck. He got his neck broke or something like that. And they actually had a shrine to that kid in the gym. So they would like in the normal Japanese fashion, they would put food up there. They would put like drinks up there for this kid. Wow. This is wow. amazing. Now it was a, Obviously, you mentioned Suzuki. He's one of the founders, so he, you know, we always felt like that idea of rough training came from them. That Ken kind of copied them, but now it kind of also seems like Ken had his own mean. You know, he it didn't take him long to adapt to that kind of thinking. But is that where he learned it from those guys? And, and well, how was Funaki compared to Suzuki for you? So, um, as far as the whole Ken. Um, I don't know if you've had any interviews with him, but he was uh, very, very physical and violent as a kid. And uh, when Bob brought him in, Bob had a, uh, a boy's home and he actually would drain the swimming pool and let these guys get in the swimming pool and fight until somebody won. So Ken has been doing this since his early teens. <laughs> yeah. 
a lot of people don't know that Ken. He's, I mean, he's the real deal. When he came out, like, like people were looking, yeah, he's just a muscle bound jerk. And I thought that too when I got into the ring with him. And then, um, like I said, he beat me up for a half an hour. I mean, both of us looked like we were in a fight. So, I mean, and I think that's one of the things that he he respected about me is that even though he was beating the crap out of me, I never quit. So, was it your initiation? Oh yeah, yeah. Ken initiated me. Most of my initiation was stand up um, because he wanted to break me. So, but I, I I mean, I grew up, my grandfather was um, military. He was in the Navy. And he also, after he got out, he became like a guard at a naval yard. So he was a rough dude. And my grandpa used to chase me through the house like Texas Chainsaw Massacre hitting me with his belt. So, you know, I had a rough childhood. (laughs) <laughs> so ken initiated you how, how does all right they talked about japan you saw some videos of ken yeah how do you connect when does the initiation take place who else is involved with it because you're one of the founding fathers of the lion's Den. so when i got there it was ken scott um this guy daniel zuniga um He's talking about Scott Bissack, Daniel Zuniga. Yeah. And no, then it was, was Noah. And Noah. Was we it were Schnab, the, Schnabke or Noah something like Schnabel. that? Yeah, Noah Schnabel. Schnabel, okay, okay. Yeah. And then there was, uh, wow, I can't remember Dan's last name. Um, but yeah, we were the, the original Lysden guys before Jason DeLucia or Frank or any of those guys came in. Wow. Okay. So talk, talk us through about how you join the conversation and obviously your rite of passage. So the conversation was, yeah, like I said, he, he asked me if I wanted to go to Japan. I told him, no, I'm afraid to fly. Um, next thing you know, he told me how much money I could make. Um, then he got me on the phone with Bob and um, Bob basically gave me the rundown. We need you to get down to Lockford. Uh, you're going to get in the ring with my son. He's going to uh, initiate you. And uh, after he initiates you, um, we'll go from there. You have, He said you have to pass. And to me, there was no, no such thing as give up. Like, it, just living where I was living. I, I lived out in, um, in first... Burson and then Calaveras County and there was a lot of racism out there so I think a lot of like just horrible things we had a cross burn in front of our land and all kind of stuff like that so I wasn't I wasn't one to just quit and give up I wasn't going to just crawl into a into a corner and cry it's like yeah let's fight I'm ready to go but you had to have some sort of red flags that go up you're going to get initiated by my son you're going to go to Japan like they're at. Nope. Really? He basically told me, you're going to get in the ring with him. And to me, that's like, okay, here's another guy I got to fight. Okay. But at the time, I didn't realize how popular it would become. To me, I was just going to get to beat people up and not get arrested for it. Is that why you just fighting? Because, like, the, you, you know, obviously you were also athletic, you know, and, and yeah. you had that, you had that going for you, but like you know, toe hold, foot long, you know, the stuff that you were learning had to be kind of like out of the blue, like mystery stuff. How, oh, how yeah. did that feel? Uh, it was very awkward, and uh, yeah, it was like uh, Ken was putting these holds on us, and I'm looking like I, I don't even want to do this, but I want to know how to get out of it. He said, "Well, first you have to learn how to put people in it." And then after you learn the mechanics of it, then you can learn how to get out of it. So, um, yeah, he would put us in hundreds of times and make us get out of it. And that's kind of how, when I learned how to put the moves on, then I was able to be like, okay, well, I, I understand this now. Now I can get out of it. So before people get their hands locked, I need to be moving. And that was kind of... Um, what Ken made us do, as soon as someone would grab our foot, he wanted us to move. 
But some of us were so lazy, you know, he would just put it on us and hurt us. And we're in there screaming. And um, I mean, like people have like walked into the door, like, is everybody all right in here? But it was just us doing training. We're hearing weird noises. Do we need to call anybody? Everybody here volunteer or voluntarily? <laughs> yeah, that that's basically I mean, we. I think Ken even got some complaints. Like we had load IPD come by one time, and um, it it wasn't because Pete was smoking weed or anything like that. They came by because people heard screams. <laughs> <laughs> now, how was it when, like, at the Lions Den, I've heard that, you know, Funaki, Suzuki, some of those guys spent some time over there training as well. TK. How, yeah. how was that? Was Ken treated by them like a peer, like an equal, or was he like their student? How did that feel for you? Oh, he was treated like a peer. Um, they actually gave him the money to start the Lions Den, and they gave him money to bring fighters over. So, yeah, they wanted him to train people and bring them over. So, yeah, he, I, he was never looked down upon. Okay, so um, your first fight, okay, ladies and gentlemen, UFC number one was November 11th, 1993. Let's, let's put this into context, okay? Vernon's first fight is September 21st, 1993. So before the UFC even exists, mm -hmm. you have flown to Japan. I can't believe you don't have like red flags going all over, and you're in the the first uh, Pancrase event ever. Yes, we are hybrid wrestlers, and they put you up against Fuke. Tell us the process, locker room. Give us Pancrase one. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, seeing as how I wasn't afraid of anybody. I went out there with my cocky little self. Um, I think I was about 180 something pounds. Um, I'm he looking across the room, yeah. looking across the room at this guy. And I'm like, yeah, this little dude. I train with Ken Shamrock, so I get out there. I start slapping him around. Next thing you know, he takes me down, and I believe it was like a minute and 38 seconds. That dude was not letting me up, so he held me down did his little spinning moves. Next thing you know, I'm tapping out. Okay. How long were you training by this time? Uh, three, somewhere around three to four months. Okay. So they had, we actually were supposed to be, it was supposed to be for Fujiwara Gumi. But then the guys from Pancrates had a falling out with Fujiwara. And so they started Pancrates. Wait, wait, wait. So, let me set the table. So Fujiwara Gumi was a pro wrestling match, uh, pro wrestling organization that did yes. stiff bouts. They would do like shoot fights occasionally and they would kind of blur the line. So Pancrase mm -hmm. says, you know what? We're going to have an organization where it's it features the wrestlers, but it's all shoot fighting. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the Japanese art of catch fighting was something that you guys would practice behind the scenes or in the gym, but it was never showcased and people never really used it in competition. Go ahead. Right. I apologize. So, yeah, um, actually Ken had learned from Carl Gotch, from what I understand, and he nice. used to have him doing a thousand squats what they call sissy squats. So Ken, not wanting to kill us, only made us do 500 squats. So there's a little bit of background on, yeah, why we were so tough. Like, we, we did stuff that normal people would be like, you guys need to quit. Like, he's abusing you. But, yeah, it just made us that much more tough. And and the and the, the root of that is actually called gotch, is what you're saying. It's, it's like gotcha yeah. system. Yeah, I mean, Gotch is, is, is all time. Like, he's not he's not a soft touch. <laughs> no. No. Did you meet so, him? Have you ever met him? I never got to meet him. Um, yeah, by the time I came in, like, he was so far removed that, okay. uh, yeah, I never had the honor to meet him. All right. So the first Pancras, like, we everybody hears about the, U, the first UFC locker room where they're taking – 
shoes away from this guy, a boxing glove away from that guy. And there's kind of almost like a, a revolt in the locker room. What yeah. was the first Pancras locker room like? So I really was not in there. Uh, Bob was there. Tino was there. Um, Ken had Scott and a couple other people, but I was not in the locker room. So Scott was sack. Yeah. Was, there, was there any hard negotiations, last minute tomfoolery, any of that? So from what I understand, from what I have been told, um, Ken was told he can't wear his shoes because they're a weapon. In Pancrase. We're talking about Pancrase. Oh, Pancrase. Okay. So, yes. no, yeah, I'm talking no Pancrase. There was no Tom Fullery in Pancrase. Like, um, and if I ever had any worked matches, my body didn't say they were worked because these guys, we were knocking the snot of each other. So, yeah, I, I, as far as I know, none of my fights were ever worked. I had to work for all of my wins. Okay. So the Pancrase locker room at Pancrase one, there was no issues. Everybody understood the rules and they were going into it without any last minute wanting to change. Correct. Um, not that for my first fight. Yeah. Everything was good. We all wore shoes. We all wore pads on our knees. Um, because of me, everyone started wearing uh, groin protectors. Um, <laughs> we weren't wearing groin protectors and, we also were not wearing mouth mouth guards, and then we started wearing them because I was a headhunter. Yeah. Two very important yeah, things, sure. I, I think, if you're entering into the, the realm of combat sports. Yeah. All right, but, so, so and Ken, Ken was the main event, and you're there with him. Did you guys at that point have the full treatment? Like, did they have translators with you? Like, and and was there like a full out rule meeting where you had ability to ask questions, or were they not that organized yet? So the rules we were told at the gym. So all of us would go to the Pancras gym in Yoka, uh, was it Yokohama? Um, yeah, Sheen, Yokohama. They had a yeah. gym. So we would all go there and we were told the rules there. So we would actually practice using the Pancras rules. And then when we got there, then the ref would do how his regular no kicks to the growing, no punching here, no elbows. You know, they do all that. So, um, yeah, we we go in knowing the rules. Okay. And, yeah, they get they gave you the atmosphere that's so interesting. They're yes. pretty organized. Yeah. yeah, they were. They were very organized. I actually liked uh, working for them. So. I can see that. All right. So, Fouke. You lose by armbar. You've got three months training. Miguel, for the record, Fouquet's record is also 0 and 0. It's the first MMA event, period. You know, the entire card is like that. Shamrock is, is fighting Funaki in the main events. And it pancreased to October 14th, 1993. Obviously, you know, less than a month later, they've got you in against the pancreas co founder, Suzuki. Yeah. I think I pissed him off. <laughs> On the first event? <laughs> On our first fight. Yeah, I think I pissed him off really bad because uh, he they don't like it if you push kick with the bottom of your shoe. To them, it's disrespect. But to me, I was Taekwondo. We would do kicks like that. Like we a teeth. Yeah. Well, yeah, that teeth didn't come until later when Maurice Smith came in. Mine was just a regular push kick. Like, I was, like, driving my heels in. And um, I remember I did a, a, a back spinning crescent, outside crescent kick, and I hit him in the face. And you actually see his hands out here, and his face does this. And after that, he shot in on me, took me down, and he was talking trash to me. Trying to get me to, I don't know what he was trying to, he wanted, my hands were so tight, he couldn't get my hands loose for an arm bar, because Ken was working with me on that. So what he did, he did a crooked neck leg head scissors, where he puts his knees on my head and turns my neck. And I thought he was going to break my neck. And uh, I tapped out. Yeah, now, what? Suzuki's the guy we, we, you know, we've talked to a lot of people. Suzuki, Funaki, the founders. Suzuki's the one who's cruel. That's that's how they describe him. That like the 
Have, is, did you feel that in that match? Like he was like, what was the trash talk like? Suzuki, you know, well, he has a thick accent. People are, I don't know, but I hear him saying, blah, 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 blah. he's talking in Japanese. Okay. So I didn't understand what he was saying, but I, I can understand that it was not happy. It was <laughs> just angry, really deep. Like, I can almost, he's like, I dare you kick me in the face, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, a growl. like a growl from his stomach. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So Suzuki, you lose to Suzuki. And the people that you're going up against for context, they've been practicing this art for years. Right. You've been doing it a few months. So. Right. The table's absolutely tilted against you in this instance, but they got an American, looks good, in shape. You know, they're, they're getting wins over an American, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say I was in shape. I didn't get in shape until, until I got into my, like, late 20s, man. I didn't even have a six-pack until I got into my late 20s. So Bob didn't even like me until I got a six-pack. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think they I had energy and that's what they wanted. I and I would back up, but I would also I was a striker and they liked that. I think they liked bringing people over that thought they were tough and trying to make them look bad. But then after that third fight, this guy was clearly bigger than me. But you're talking about November 8th, 1993, Pancurry 3, Katsumi Inagaki. Yes. Yeah, he was a young boy, but he was clearly bigger than me. From Gumi Dojo. Yeah. So he, yeah. he's he been doing shoot fighting for years at this right. point. Right, he, because he's got the cauliflower ear. Um, he wasn't the top boy, uh, young boy. They, I believe at that time their, their top boy was um, Takahashi. Okay. Takahashi and uh, Yanagi Sawarushi, those two were the top. And uh, I think Ken actually fought Takahashi that night that I fought in Nagaki. Well, you get your first win. Yeah, I get my first win. Um, yeah, I think it was in, did I knock him out? I think I did knock him out. It was a doctor stoppage, correct? Doctor stoppage? Okay. Yeah. So it's a knockout. The... <laughs> so you're three fights in, you've never flown on an airplane before you said you're flying to japan and is there any issues with like the culture the time change you're not even in they like, eating the same food you know um the language barrier was rough but um when you're a professional fighter and people start to see you in magazines a lot of the people who speak English start to come out of the woodwork okay. and they actually, they make sure that you are well taken care of. Like I've had guys like take me to dinner and like, they're like Ken's buddies. He would take us out to dinner and pay for everybody to eat. And I'm like, um, Oh, here's some money. Do you want to? No, no, no. You keep your money. And I'm like, all right, more money to drink with. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let, let me, so first of all, I guess you're not in a doctor that third fight. You went 22 minutes. So I, I was going to ask you for some yeah. some description on that in-ring stuff first. Um, I I just know that the kid had heart because um, I hit him with karate chops. I hit him with push kicks. And uh, kicking was my thing. It was my forte because I was Taekwondo. And no one else – took the punishment that that kid took. No one else there took that punishment. Um, and I had a lot of respect for him after that fight was over. I got you. Now, me and Mike have a little side bet here. Actually, oh, Ken yeah. fought Fouke, uh, the guy who beat you in your first fight, and he, he yeah. ran him over. Um, uh, the Japanese guy in question fought a guy named James Matthews. Do you remember this American guy that was over there named James Matthews? Was Boy, let's talk about too? the bet. All right. So James, James Matthews, Matthews was one of our young boys. I just won that bet. Vernon, yep. thank you, buddy. So, James yep. Matthews, he's 0-4. Uh, 
It's yeah. only in Pancras, and he's American, and there's zero on him. So is he a lot? So he's a Lions Den young boy. He was, yes. And I actually trained him. Ken made me train him for the fights. So okay. um, because I had already been in there before he had his first fight, Ken felt like it would help him to train with me. But he, this kid, I kid you not, he actually told Ken, come on, man, I can't do this. He's already been fighting professionally. I'm like, James, you're getting ready to go fight professionals. Man up. Yeah. No, Ken you can't. Doesn't, re doesn't react well to that. You can't have that. No, he was Ken does not react well to that at all. <laughs> now, we, we thought he was either a Matt Hume guy or a Lion's Den guy. Somebody we knew brought him brought him along. Okay. Yeah, it wow. was us. So you guys weren't that deep at this point in regards to, to fighting, but it's about to change. Because November 11th, 1993, UFC 1 comes to Colorado, and you're in the corner of Ken Shamrock. What was that like? Now you're in the United States doing it. So... I didn't have a big name here, so it was fun for me. Like, I didn't have people, give me an autograph. Can I have a picture? I didn't have none of that. Um, and I actually got to meet people like David Hasselhoff. I got to meet, like, like I'm like, Knight Rider, cool. But he was he turned out to be a jerk, so I didn't like him. <laughs> I, I actually met John Bobbitt. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dude, again, is, yeah. Okay. And I am such a nice guy. John Bobbitt asked if he could hang out with us. This guy, he ruined our night. This idiot, me and my friend were with some girls. John Bobbitt thought he was going to be the man of the night, and he came and jumped in the hot tub in his underwear. We had the biggest laugh at this poor guy, and then he <laughs> left. <laughs> but he deserved it. <laughs> I mean, you're with two professional fighters in great shape. We're with some girls, and you think that you're going to jump your little butt in the hot tub and take our girls from us? Get out of here. And he uh, he was missing some stuff, too, uh, after. I think they oh, found right. it and sewed it, sewed it back on. Yeah, but yeah, yeah Lorena. She and cut the grass. They took fat from other parts of his body and tried to make it look bigger, but it didn't work. All right, UFC won. How chaotic was it? What was the hotel like? Any any pre-fight bravado taking place outside of the cage? Always. There's always somebody walking around like the proud peacock from NBC. And um, people talk trash because that's what they want. They want you to sell the fight. So I'm sitting back like, Ken wants me to be mad, and I can't. I'm like, not fanboying, but I'm like, Dude, I'm here with my bro, and I'm seeing these guys that are getting ready to get into fights, and I'm like, one of these days is going to be me. So, yeah, I was like, I was loving it. It was, it was, there's nothing like being in your first big fight in your own country or watching someone that you know and love as a brother fight in your own country. You know, there's nothing like that at all. Being that you guys had a lot more experience than everybody else outside of the Gracie family, which were relative unknowns at this time, did uh, you guys kind of go in there with a little bit of arrogance, like you planned on winning this tournament as a team? Well, you have to. I mean, you're not a real fighter if you don't go in and think you can spank everybody. You know, that's what you're trained for. If you don't train for that, then – you might as well get out. If you you got to train, you got to know that you might hurt yourself or or you know anything bad could happen while you're in there. And but you have to like, I don't care. Like when I fought Chuck Liddell, I broke my hand, and I kept fighting. And people ask me why did you keep fighting? Because I'm a warrior. You you push through stuff even if you have a broken thumb. You go. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, right. that's so the, I think I think the question with Ken, like I think Ken, did Ken put you up to it? Like we got to, we, 
Lions Den behaves this way? Like, was that like a, 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 an education you had to take? Because you personality wise, you're very much like you're funny. Ken's very serious. You know what I mean? It's like you're. So did you were you forced to act a certain way? So he wanted us to act like uh, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you, but because that was his persona. I don't want to talk. I got a fight coming up. Get away from me. I need to focus. But like me, I w- I would be in Japan, like waving to the the uh, all the uh, the people out in the audience, you know, and they'd be like, go in the back and rest. Go go sit down. Knock it off. You know. So um, yeah, Ken was very by Bob's book. You know, seclude yourself. Get angry. Go out there and win, and then you can go out and have fun with people. Okay. Well, here. UFC one, you guys pull in, you see the lineup, you see who's there. It's an international affair. Who did you guys think would be your most difficult opponent? For sure, Gracie. So you guys knew of the Gracie family prior? Well, yeah, because we had Jason DeLucia, who actually fought Gracie in the first UFC. And so Jason came with us to help Ken get ready for, for Hoist. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're right. He, Jason Delucci actually fought Hoist in a challenge match way before the UFC. So, yeah, he yeah. knew him. Yeah. So, now, um, Jason yeah. says Ken didn't take that advice very seriously. He was like, Grace, he's like 170 pounds, and he wasn't that worried. How, how do you describe Ken? Once, a, Yeah, he was very cocky. Like, he, he went into that. Uh, he went into that fight thinking, yeah, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, there's nothing he can do. And, um, yeah, I mean, he had never fought someone, and not even Jason had half of the intelligence in the ring that Hoist did. So, Jason, there was no way he could prepare Ken for a fight with Hoist. So, um, Ken basically just got all jacked up for his second fight, and you see how that went. Even with not having someone good enough to train with, Ken trained himself for that second fight and had a draw with Hoist, which everyone knows it wasn't a draw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me bring it back to the Lions Den tryouts. Okay. You guys actually, in 1999, had Jens Pulver, Little Evil, tryout. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Um, <laughs> um, I don't think – I think Jens went with um, Mikey Burnett, if I'm not uh, – if I'm not mistaken, I think I did a lot of yelling and, and, and cussing and trying to break people down mentally. But uh, I believe he did most of his stuff with Mikey Burnett or Joe Hurley. I can't remember exactly. And do, do you remember the outcome of his tryout? No, I don't. Yeah, the rumor is he got cut. He said he passed the tryout and he said, yeah, we just don't have anybody your size. You can't make the team. Something like uh, that. That sounds like something Ken would say. Like, I mean, he he didn't sugarcoat anything. So now, now at some point you you participated too, you know. So, like, do you remember particularly, like, when you broke somebody in that and and they couldn't take it and they left something interesting or an old story like that? <laughs> uh, there has been a lot of guys that can be. I, I had to roll with uh, what was his name? Uh, Oh my gosh. I had to go with Guy. Uh, I had to go with uh, Frank a little bit for his. Uh, I, no, actually, Ken beat up Frank and then he let me go with him. Um, yeah, there was a bunch of people. I, I can't even remember how many people Ken had me rolling with, but it was always fun because he didn't want us to, to, he didn't want us to break them down so bad that they wanted to leave, but he did want us to work with them. So a lot of times he'd be like, put a choke on and let him work out. So that way he can learn. What about the first Lions Den gym? What did that look like? Um, a warehouse, basically. Um, we had a, a roll-up garage door um, where it looks like uh, people could bring um, back semis up to and unload stuff. That area was actually where we had our hammer strength gym and our um, our uh, our ring, which was on the floor. And underneath the ring was a little bit of mats 
And uh, yeah, that was the worst place to work out ever because some of those mats had spaces in them. And we were so aware of where those spaces were that we would actually take each other down away from those spaces so we wouldn't hurt ourselves. Because we've had guys actually drill each other into those spots and they would hurt their elbows and knees. And like we had a couple guys like hurt their shoulders. So yeah, and Pete Williams even picked me up and threw me on my shoulder and, and I was out for a while. Like I hurt my, uh, my rotator cuff. Wow. Wow. Well, after November, Ken competes in the UFC. You guys, in December 8th, 1993, you guys head back to Japan and fight in Pancrase again. Were there meetings with the heads of Pancrase in regards to what took place with the UFC? Were they fishing for information? Any concern on their end? The funny thing that they, they ever asked me was, did Ken have surgery for gyno? I'm like, no, fuck, I ain't telling you that. That's not my business. Excuse my language, but uh, yeah, they were trying to get me to tell them that Ken was taking steroids, and but yeah, there was not really. They didn't talk to me that much about business stuff, but I also didn't put it out there. So, like, I just I was there to fight, make my money, and go home. Now, some of these fights in Pancras, you're one, two, three, four. Like, you're fighting three weeks apart at some point. Yeah. Like, were you going back and forth, or did you ever just stay over there for a prolonged period of time? Uh, when I was there for the two and a half months, yeah, it was it was kind of nice because I didn't we we traveled on the Shinkansen, the jet or or um, what they call it, the bullet train. But mm -hmm. yeah, we were coming back and forth on the plane, sometimes thirteen hours just between L.A. and Japan because of the headwinds. Yeah. Wow. All right, so. You fight Ryushi Yanagasawa on uh, December 3rd. You lose a decision there. Mm -hmm. But Shamrock missed UFC 2 with a broken hand, allegedly. Uh, but he fights Yan Yanagasawa April 21st. So UFC 2 was March 10th. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, I can't do it. My hands hurt. But he has a quick turnaround April 21st. And he fights in Pancrase against that exact same opponent. Was yeah. Ken leveraging anything between the two organizations for money, or was he legitimately hurt? His hand was broke because he also he was supposed to yeah he was supposed to fight Hoist, but um, we were training and I went to kick him and he opened his hand and he blocked my kick and his he got a, a boxing spiral fracture on his hand. So, yeah, that was legitimate, but um, he had people like uh, Dan. So I probably shouldn't be saying names, but he's had some bodybuilder friends that knew how to get him healed up fast. Okay. So he could get back into the ring. Well, Vern, at the time, that's, that was the game. Like, if, if you weren't doing that, the person across from you certainly was, and you right. had to level the playing field. It is right. what it is. And it's... Right. I mean, Ken, I don't know if you've read his latest book, but the stuff that he admitted to in that book, it should be a bestseller based on what he literally admitted to in steroids absolutely was one of them. Well, yeah, they actually called me about that book, too. So, yeah, I got to put my two cents in as well. So, <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, we all at one time or another did do it. And once again, like I, I was naturally 185 pounds and I went up to 205. You know, so um, there you go there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the game. That, that's the game, man. Um, yeah, especially I, back then with no weight classes and, and that sort of stuff. You know, that would come yeah. later. But in the early days, size and strength were made, you know. Yeah. You know, that UFC 2, I'm glad you cleared that up because that's kind of like we've got, you know, little conspiracy theories in regards like we, we get super nerdy with this stuff and it's like um, wait a minute he fought this date but not that date was he trying to leverage because you know ken yeah. certainly knows how to play the game in regards to a contract yeah. um so december 8th 1993 you fight yagasawa yagasawa 
And you have a quick turnaround January 19th where you fight a Dutch boxer, Andre Van Den Oetlaar. Oetlaar, yeah. Yep. One of the uh, – that guy was nasty. Um, I just remember, yeah, he was one of Boss Rudin's guys, him and Keith Bessems. So they all came over from Holland. Keith Bessems was a decent guy, but Andre Von Utelar, he smelled horrible. Not only did he smell horrible, the dude smoked, and um, he talked a lot of trash. He talked a lot of trash. And uh, I just remember when I got into the ring with him, he just overpowered me. And um, the one hit that I did get on him, I remember I hit him, his face opened up and he started bleeding everywhere. And then he tried to say that I scratched him with my nail when you can perfectly see I hit and then turn my wrist or turn my palm and sliced him open because he was an old man with old man skin and it just, it, the integrity wasn't there. So, um, yeah, and then he was, like, dripping his blood in my eyes, and, like, that dude wasn't tested. Like, I actually got scared after that fight. I thought I was going to have some kind of blood-borne pathogen in my eyes. <laughs> well, yeah, Funaki, you had mentioned that Funaki took you in, but you ended up fighting in March 12, 1994 on Pancrash 2. Was this before or after you had trained with him? Oh, man. Um, I don't even remember what year that I went over there and stayed for the two months. I just remember I started getting better and I started winning more after I went there because their training regimen was so much more strenuous. And I didn't have the – what's the word I'm looking for? I'm losing my words. Uh, I didn't have the – Distractions. distractions. Yes, I didn't have the distractions of the girlfriend and and everything that was going on there at that time. So I was able to focus, which I think was probably the best thing for me. And um, after I came back, yeah, my my whole career changed. Okay, so that that's this fight took place prior. Funaki, obviously is somebody that is revered in the catch wrestling circles. Uh, you lose to a knockout in the body. Um, but on April 21st, 1994, you fight Boss Rutten. Uh-huh. Is this kind of where the Lion's Den Boss Rutten rivalry started? It actually started, he fought, I believe it was Frank before he fought me. Then they had me fight him and then they had, and Jason fought him. So I was kind of like the last one before Ken fought him again. I believe Ken fought him and beat him. Then Ken had to fight him again in the King of Pancrase tournament. And Fanaki, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there training with Ken and Boss and all those guys when Ken fought him in the King of Pancrase tournament. And they wanted him to win. Actually, no, they wanted Yamada to win. And Boss wouldn't do it, so they turned Ken loose on on Boss, and Ken beat Boss. Or was it the other way around? No, Yamada was supposed to let Suzuki win. That's right. Yamada was supposed to let Suzuki win, and he didn't. So then Ken beat Yamada to get the belt because Yamada didn't let Suzuki win. Okay. Okay. So, Boss Rutten, how are we describing the Lions then at Boss Rutten um, outside of the ring? Oh, we partied together. Um, Boss really? Rutten had met, yeah. We met the, uh, the music group um, Biohazard. And so Boss was hanging out with the guys. And next thing you know, he's like, hey, I met these guys. We're going to go to a concert. And we get into this concert. And... I meet this guy and I'm like, oh my God, what, what, what are we doing here? Next thing you know, we're on the second floor and there's all these Japanese dudes and girls and some of them knew who we were. <clears throat> so this guy, Evan, and all his guys are like, hey man, we know who you guys are. We came and watched your fights and uh, we want you to do whatever you want to do. And I'm like, okay, so we're all up on stage like a bunch of idiots. 
Next thing you know, some Japanese dudes run up on stage. I grabbed one, picked him up over my head and threw him out into the crowd. Next thing you know, Boss grabbed one. And everybody starts grabbing dudes and they're, they're loving it because then they're crowd surfing after we pick them up and throw them out into the crowd. Yeah, that was wild. I've never picked anyone up over my head before in my life. <laughs> so in essence, what took place in the ring was completely separate than what took place outside of there. Yeah, it, it was not like UFC. Like if Ken and Tito saw each other outside the ring, they want to fight. Yeah, that was like, it was business. And I mean, we all knew it was business. So yeah, we didn't carry any grudges. There was a, like Jason sometimes would carry grudges outside the ring, but I mean, you lost, dude. Let it go. There's no reason to be like trying to fight outside the ring, especially in another country where you can get in trouble. All right. Hit, you talked about Tito and Ken fighting outside the ring. At UFC 19, did Hammer House protect Tito from you guys beating him up? Hmm. That, that that's question comes from uh, all right. So on our YouTube channel, a lot of people throw these little nerdy facts in there. I always try to give him credit. Scotty Y, he posted that, and I I actually texted Mark Coleman in regards to it, and Mark yeah. said, I mean, I'm it was a text message, but I'm kind of like a, you know channeling him. It's yeah, it's a little hazy, but I remember <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't remember for sure at UFC 19. I don't – which one – so let, Let's scratch UFC 19. Prior okay. to Ken or even Frank fighting Tito, did you guys almost fight – as Lions and almost fight him at one of the UFCs? I, I remember being in uh, – where were we? We were right outside Canada, and uh, I just the fight I remember was Tank Abbott. I don't remember anything with Tito, but I remember Tank Abbott wasn't there, but his cronies were out, and Frank beat the crap out of one of uh, Tank's guys, and like no one wanted to fight me. Like they're all running away from me, running away from everybody else, and. But we were, like, stopping them from jumping in on Frank while he was beating up this other guy. But as far as the Tito, I don't remember. I must not have been there when that happened. Okay. So Frank actually recalled that. I guess the guy threw a hamburger at him, and yeah. Frank beat him up. And then the next day, oh, yeah. they shook hands or something like that, and Frank was, like, shocked that they would shake hands. But it, it yeah. all worked out. Yeah. Tank Abbott and his crew had a habit of beating up people in elevators, <laughs> creating issues. I think Alan Goez caught some yeah. in Puerto Rico. Did, yeah. you, did Lions Den and the Huntington Beach crew ever almost come to uh, to blows? Um, I have to say probably yes, but uh, if it wasn't significant, that's why I don't remember it. Because I don't remember ever having to go to blow to any of these guys. Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, thanks from Southern California. Did you have it like an idea of his reputation, or like, I mean, obviously you guys had a big rep too, and and you were big, but like, was there some respect that way? Because you know, we know the UFC wanted Duke Ten and and, and Tank at some point. It, mm -hmm. It's a it's a glossy fight. It looks good, and it never happened. But yeah. I get the feeling Tank wouldn't mess with Ken, like, all out backstage kind of thing. Ken's not so to be messed with. There's certain well, people you can't get away with that with. He did say he wanted the, a piece of the glam rock. Was what he he used, did say the that. terminology he used. But, yeah, it never happened. Why? I don't know. I think it's because he ended up getting hurt or something. And so, yeah, he was smart enough to not take the fight. Um, I think he even – was it a tournament? They were supposed to meet each other and Tank backed out, I believe? Yeah, it could be early. I'm. It's interesting. So you're in Japan, July 6, 1994, and you fight a legend of the sport, Remco Pardue. Uh -huh. Was there any 
we did you have any anxiety or anything like that prior to your bouts? Mm, not really. I just uh, I knew that he was good at jujitsu, or I'm sorry, knew that he was good at judo, and I knew that he was going to throw me. So we had been working on me getting out. Um, and, uh, I knew he couldn't elbow me in the face. Like he did that one, uh, the one dude in the uh, UFC. So I, yeah, I wasn't that worried about the fight. I probably should have been doing a lot more weight training for that fight. Cause that dude was, I think he was like almost 300 pounds and yeah, he just, he threw me around. And I remember getting one time on his back and choking him and he actually had to grab the ropes because he kicked me in the nuts and it pissed me off. Mm-hmm. So, and that was at the time when I wasn't wearing, none of us were wearing cups. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, Jay, Delucia told us that uh, Ken, at this point with his UFC stuff, kind of guided Delucia, like, you stay in Pancrase, I'll, and you, I'll stay in UFC. Did you have a similar conversation with him where? Like he was going to be in the U.S. and keep putting, you know, you keep going in in Japan because you're you 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 were advanced early enough that you should have been in one of the earlier UFCs, you know. Um, I would have liked to, but yeah, he said I wasn't ready. Those were his exact words. Just I was not ready for that type of fighting. Hmm. Well, but what? How'd you react to that? I know, like you know. He's not the kind of guy that wants to have a conversation with you about it. He's just telling you. But what did you think? How how did that go for you? Well, I'm wondering to myself, why is it that people like Jerry Bolander, who just came in and was a young boy, and and I know he had a wrestling background, but Jerry couldn't beat me, but he let Jerry go in. Um, Me and Frank would go back and forth, but he let Frank go in. and, And he like... Yeah, it, it there were some harsh feelings there, but I was like, whatever, you know, I'll get my chance sooner or later. And bro, now I was gonna ask you, your, since, yeah, since we're in that yeah. tough question neighborhood in Japan, obviously you mentioned camaraderie with boss and stuff, and I think it comes, you know, the Japanese are prejudiced against everybody. But you are what, you know, you were like a, a black athlete over there. Did you ever feel uncomfortable? Because, I mean, sometimes that cartoony feel, and, and you know, in, you're, you're inside your person. So, like, did you ever, were you ever bothered by the Japanese treatment? Um, They never came out and, like, said any, like, anything racist or anything like that. And they would actually take us out to eat. Like, one of the guys, he had a, a Korean barbecue. And he wouldn't take like boss and those guys out because they didn't know how to act, but he would take the lion's den guys out. So, um, I felt respected in that aspect. I, I, yeah, I never felt like they treated me like a, um, an outcast. Okay, cool. Good. He was, I know like a lot of you guys were, we had to go and party in Rapungi because the local bars would say no, you know, no, no foreigners allowed. So it, it, it's something that to me. It's something that gets. Go ahead. Yeah, I never had that happen to me because I wasn't in there trying to fight people. I know Boss got turned down a lot because of his tattoos, and um, like I, I, he told me where he tried to go to one of the bathhouses, and they told him no that he'd have to cover up his tattoos. But I don't remember ever going to a club and being told I couldn't go in because I was a foreigner. Okay. But then again, I, I, I liked going to, there was a, it's called Gas Panic. I loved going there. Like, I just missed meeting Madonna there one night by like five minutes. So, yeah. Um, I so, wouldn't try to go to cool. the <laughs> I didn't feel so, right. So, Miguel, maybe Lytle and Bass were, you know, a little tipsy. They recognized it. They saw the ears and said, nah, you're not coming well, here. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> There, there's a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes in Japan where, yeah, I'm looking at these guys going, I don't ever want to hang out with you again. This is not cool. So, and, and I'm not going to say what it is because uh, we do have kind of like this this code that we don't. That's fair. Each other. 
All right, so check this out. He fights Remco Pardue July 6, 1994. July 26, 1994, you fight Inagaki again. Did you come home or did you stay there in between fights? I went home. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're just screwing your time schedule up. Yeah. And then you come back, you fight Richard Saar in mm-hmm. Pancras 11, September 1st, 1994. Yeah. You pick up another win there by Palm Strikes. Yeah. Yeah, he was talking a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> talking about how he was going to knock me out. And actually, he wasn't even who I was supposed to fight. I was supposed to fight another loudmouth. And um, yeah, and then they threw him in instead. Okay. And the dude that I thought actually fought, did he fight Scott? I think they thought he was going to be too much for me. So he went and got beat. Then Richard Starr got beat. He actually, what really pissed me off about Richard Starr was during that fight, he pushed me through the ropes. So that lit a fire under my butt. And I'm like, yeah, it, uh, I'm, I'm putting him out now. Okay. So that's September 1st. September 9th, 1994, you're at UFC 3, where Ken Shamrock makes it to the finals. In the finals, Hoist Gracie pulls out because I think I think it was Chemo that eliminated him, even though he beat Chemo. And yeah. he, he, he's got Harold Howard on the other side. Do you remember the conversations in the locker room when Ken pulled out? He just said he was he couldn't do it. Um, I don't. I, he had been having problems with his shoulders and with his knees, and um, he actually had to get surgery. And he had cadaver uh, ligaments put in his knee to to reconstruct his knee. So, from what I gather, I mean Steve Jenham obviously replaces Ken Shamrock, and he's the first non Gracie to win the UFC tournament. By beating uh-huh. Harold Howard. Art Davy said he remembers the conversation where Bob Shamrock was furious that Ken wouldn't go in there and fight would, would fight Her, uh, Harold Howard for I mean fifty thousand. Well, yeah, he you're right. He did say I came for Hoyt, not this guy. Okay. So yeah, I do remember that now. He said in hey, our, if our, Hoyt, there's nobody. It did that's crazy. Did in did that separate Bob and Ken for a little bit? Um, yeah. Um, Ken even stopped letting Bob handle his fights for a long time because of that. Like, he felt very disrespected. Now, do you, like, like, what do you think of that? Like, you're a fighter, and it's like, you know, you got, you got your own mindset, Man. your own way of getting up. But like, you said you're not a quitter or anything like that. Didn't that seem a little weird to you? Like, you know, you're not going to give them advice. You can't do that. But, I mean, inside, didn't you feel a little weird? Um, Yeah, because it made us have to deal with Ken's ex-wife, and nobody liked her. Like, there was <laughs> drama when it came to her. And, um, yeah, it's just – I came into the lion's den because of Ken and because of Bob. And now part of that – was gone because Bob was no longer, I mean, we still hung out with him and talked to him and, you know, but yeah, it the lions then changed drastically when Bob was no longer involved. So Ken's wife at the time was yeah. now managing you guys. Yeah. And she oh, did wow. everything that Ken told her to. And like, and we'd have to talk to her on the phone. Like we couldn't even talk to Ken. Ken like secluded himself because Bob was normally the one who would talk to us. So yeah, he just kind of like, yes, you need to talk to my wife. So I don't even like your wife, you know? So the entire dynamic of the conversations changed completely and it put Ken in a place where he probably wasn't really comfortable. Wow. Yeah. Well, it seems weird too because, like, so obviously, when you fought, if Ken's wife is managing you, I mean, are you having to take a piece of your pay and give it to Ken's wife now? Yeah. Yep. As soon as the fight was over, like, sometimes we'd have to pay 20 bucks to get out of the country in Japan. And then we'd also have to pay Ken 15% of what we made. 
Yeah. Hmm. So, and, and he said that was for the gym. But, like, a part of me was like, wait a minute, why are we paying you 15% of what we make and the Japanese are paying you to bring us over there? How, how, do, how does that work? Yeah. So, but I'm, I let it go because I, for, for my greater good, I knew I was making a name for myself and this is going to help me in the long run. Yeah, and you had no other options. You know, I mean, you were held hostage. I had some people actually try to get me to go to Randy Couture's, and I wouldn't go because I'm not moving to Oregon. You know, um, uh, and there were some other people, they were like, hey, Pat Militech, well, Ken's a jerk, go to Pat Militech's. And I'm like, yeah, no, because the wife I have now, she's from Chicago. So had I known her at that time, I probably would have moved out there and started working with Pat Militech and his guys. But yeah, there was no reason for me to go there. What part well, of Chicago? What about, what about wait, wait, other options? This uh, is important. What part of Chicago? Aurora, Illinois, just okay. right outside of Chicago. Nice little suburb. Okay, I'm from the south side, Vernon. We're very All right. strict. All right, we, throw, we hear the word Chicago, we find out where. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, what about some of the other, because you? I think one of the things that strikes me too is for all of Ken's faults, people are very loyal to him, you know, and that speaks something about him. You had other options besides Couture. There was Dan Henderson's close by. There were, you know, in Northern California, there were uh, even Ralph Gracie, well, Eric Temecula, Yeah, Temecula didn't exist at them, but he did have Caesar Gracie. Yeah. Well, yeah. To what about Paulson? Was, you know, guys like Paulson. You you had options. I think was it your loyalty just driving you? Yeah, I mean, he was the closest thing I had to a brother. So, yeah, I I stayed with him because it's like, if it wasn't for him, I would not have been there. So, but yeah, after a while, I did leave. Like around two thousand ten, I actually left and went to the Gracies. So. I was training out here with uh, at um, Gary Great's place, and he was uh, with, I believe, it was Caesar, not Caesar. Uh... Ralph. No, I have to. I'll have to go back. I have to okay. go back and look at it. I know but yeah, no it was for sure a Gracie Academy. You also trained at a boxing gym. So. That was uh, that was Tony Galindo's buddy. I forgot his name. Um, yeah, he came in and he actually worked with um, he worked with all of us. And I, I believe Martinez was his name. And um, yeah, he he worked with me before my fight with uh, Todd Medina. And I ended up uh, knocking Todd Medina out in the first. It was actually a six-second fight, but they called it a nine-second fight because at, when I went back and I looked at the uh, at the um, the film, I had knocked him down. He was down at six seconds, and then they they uh, walked over to him, made sure he was okay, and then they stopped the fight at uh, nine seconds. And then Pete and Tony came and stole my uh, thunder. They got the fastest hmm. knockout. You, uh, I think that was called City Boxing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, City okay. Boxing. It was City Boxing. Okay. See, even City Boxing had an association too with Dean Lister, I believe. Yes, they did. And so, yeah, then we had Dean. He started coming down and training with us as well. Because okay, actually, cool. yeah, I had a jujitsu match against Dean in. Oh, I can't remember the name of the place. It's been so long. But, uh, yeah, we had a draw, and Dean's trainer was very upset because uh, I wouldn't give Dean any of my um, appendages for him to do anything with. And so he's screaming, tell your man to move. And, but when I did move, Dean couldn't do anything with me. So we, we had a draw. Hey, I'll um, take that. A draw yeah. against Dean Lister's a W as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and my thing wasn't grappling. My thing was – punching and kicking people. Yes. Everybody yes. knew. So, yeah, for me to go in with somebody whose black belt level is a jiu-jitsu 
and I haven't done any jujitsu, yeah, it was a win for me. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. You kidding me? Let's take it back to UFC three. Guy Metzger's in the audience. He seeks out Bob Shamrock, wanting to join the Lions Den. Do you remember meeting him there, or was your first introduction to him at the uh, at the dojo? Um, I don't remember a guy at the at the fight. Uh, that was the last thing on my mind was Guy Mesger <laughs> at the fight. Like once again, I I'm like I'm in this huge auditorium watching my brother fight, and you know it's like. It, it was uh, an awesome place to be. A lot of that stuff I don't remember. You know, you like just go through some places and you're like in in such awe and then you start to forget stuff. But then again, I've been hitting the head so many times. Yeah, it's about time I start to forget stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can you, do you remember your initiation with, I should say, Guy's initiation? I believe you were the one. Scott Bissack yeah. told us you were the one that fought him and kind of blessed him into the uh, the den. Yeah, um, Ken had me fight him because he, Ken wanted him. Ken basically wanted Guy because Guy was a good-looking kid. So um, we didn't – I had a fight coming up. Guy had a fight coming up. So we didn't kill each other, but we did. We went at it because I hated Guy because he came in like, I'm so beautiful, love me, I'm Guy Mesger. And um, so, yeah, um, a couple times I got some uh, leg locks on him and Ken made me stop because he knew I wanted to rip it off and take it home. Um, but, yeah, and, and watching guys fight, I'm like, yeah, I could beat this guy. <laughs> so but then after a while, um, I started liking guy, even though he was still a pompous piece of work. He always thought he was like this chiseled God and no one could get next to him. But I still had his back no matter what happened because he was still yes. we led together and sweat together. So might as well have his back. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Well, it's pretty clicky. I mean, any any type of gym situation you're going to be. Um, what about Steve Bruno, a current American top team uh, trainer? I know he was a young boy at one point with the Lions done. Yeah. 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 Um, I had actually given him the name of Unbreakable Steve Bruno because uh, he got into a, uh, a helicopter accident and he actually couldn't fight for a while because of that accident. But um, yeah, he was, uh, he had heart, but uh, he was a bit of a prima donna too. Bruno was, uh, Ken would always get mad at him because you could tell that he was doing a lot of half-assing. And um exactly. Some he, there were some fights that he should have won that he didn't because we saw him. He was just like, I'm too good for this, you know, and almost like guy, like I'm too good for this. No, you're not. Get in there, do the work, shut up. And I think he got tired of it, and that's when he left. Let, let me let me take us a step back here because you know we're up to Steve Bruno, but I want to hear about how Jerry Bolander and Petey showed up at the Lions then because you got yes. early California guys and even Mesger and Burnett, Tang Litton. So, like, Jerry fought in UFC 8 or something like that. Talk, talk about how they showed up and where they came on the radar. So, uh, yeah, Pete and Jerry were both very good wrestlers. Um, and uh, that's what Ken wanted. Ken saw um, – that wrestlers did well in the UFC. So that's what he was uh, gearing his new fighters towards. Um, and also it, it helped me because it helped me to stop people from taking me down, even though I didn't care because I was well-versed on the ground after a while. I wanted people to take me down, so I would hit them even harder so I could get to the ground with them and submit them. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that's what's – that was Ken's whole thing was he wanted to get wrestlers in there because, yeah, that's what we were looking at in UFC. If you went to UFC, you're going to fight a wrestler or you're going to fight a jujitsu guy. So, Bo Lander, did you gel with him right away or was there uh, a little bit of a grind before you guys got on the same page? So, Bo Lander, very cocky. 
Uh, I started calling him Bootlegger just to piss him off. Um, but yeah, he just seemed like a, a country boy. He used to chew and like spit and like he just irritated me. And uh, Pete was his friend, so I didn't like Pete either. So, but yeah, I mean, we still, I mean, they became part of the family. So there's just certain people in the family that you have to learn how to get along with. And if you don't, then oh well. Hmm. Yeah, Bullander, yeah. uh, his fight with Ferozo, Scott Ferozo, it's uh -huh. a heroic performance. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'd have to say his his even his fight with uh, why can't I remember? It? I forgot his name. Though. The big black dude that he fought, the one that busted his teeth out. Uh, Goodrich, oh Gary Goodrich. Goodrich. Yes, like the uh, I feel like that fight never should have happened. Um, yeah. he was not ready for that fight, but Ken wanted him to take it. Well, he, let me let me rewind just a little bit so. Going into UFC 8, Bolander's walking to the cage with a black eye. Yeah. The announcers said the reason that Bolander's here is because he and Pete Williams had to have a fight at the Lion's Den gym, and the winner got to represent Lion's Den in the David versus Goliath tournament. Yeah. What was the fight like between the two of them? Well, Jerry did his thing. Takes downs, ground to pound, um, submissions. Like, Jerry was a well-rounded wrestler. Like, I believe he took state a couple times for, for Livermore. So, wow. Jerry was, uh, yeah, he was no joke when it came to wrestling. And then when he got his other skills, yeah, he just, he dominated people. He would just hold them down to punish them. So he was ahead of Petey in terms of learning and stuff, huh? Yes. Well, Pete was like, how do I explain Pete? <sighs> Love Pete to death, but Pete was kind of slow when it came to submissions, and he was kind of slow when it came to um, to even stand up. Like things came a lot slower to him. But then again, he was also a big guy, so nothing was fast with Pete at all until he dropped about. 40 pounds, and then he started getting some speed. He's also easygoing, you know, kind of like personality-wise. They made their debuts in Hawaii, though. Were you were you on that trip to Hawaii? How, how was that? Because that's a whole new world. Super Brawl was, yeah. at one point, maybe the biggest show in the world. Yes, um, I remember because uh, we were all sharing a hotel room. We had just came back from uh, Japan. And then we stopped over in Hawaii and we went to the fights and uh, yeah, it was crazy. We all shared the same hotel room. Like that was the worst trip ever to have like <laughs> two rooms in the same freaking hotel. Everybody got a, a bed, but me, I'm sleeping in a damn bathtub. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. All right. The one interesting thing, like I said, we've got a lot of conspiracies going on here. And it's just nerdy little questions that with people with way too much time on their hands, you know, have. And that, that you know, pretty much sums up Miguel and I. So Jerry Bolander, Frank and Ken, there seem to be a little bit of, at odds with each other in, in regards to Jerry Bolander. Uh, Frank, I should say, Frank would tell the announcers to say managed by Ken Shamrock, but trained by Frank Shamrock. It seemed as almost as if there was a tug of war with Jerry. Did you sense that? Of course. Um, and uh, yeah, Frank actually was not supposed to go to UFC first. Jerry was. So, but Frank just kind of turned while Ken was out doing his WWF thing. And um Ken got pissed off about it, came back, beat up Frank, and that's when Frank left. Okay. Did Frank try to take take Jerry Bolander with him? That I don't know. I just know I came back and they said, Frank's gone. Don't talk to him anymore. Okay. But, yeah, I'm not sure if he tried to take Jerry with him or not. I, that I just got that feeling. Like, all you had to do was just watch the body language. 
It seemed like mm-hmm. it was it, it, at a point in one of Jerry's fights, Ken was in the audience. He wasn't going to corner him. You know, he's all dressed to the nines, got his glasses on, everything. After one round, Ken is in the corner, like taking, you know, taking control of the corner again. He just he couldn't delegate that to Frank. <clears throat> You know, there was a moment though at those UFCs where um, Jerry, Petey were like the front line guys fighting. Frank had the belt, and Frank had left with Maurice, and Ken had not come back yet. Petey and Jerry at times looked like you know, like they were missing a mentor there. And then Ken came back, but it could. It looks like they resent Frank. Like, what? Why would they resent Frank? I feel like Frank left with Maurice because Penn wasn't there anymore. What? What was going on there? Well, Frank was our brother, you know, and and he ducked out. You know, times got hard, and he ducked out. We all took our butt kickings, all of us. But his little prima donna attitude at that time was, "You're not going to put your hands on me." You know, I got a name, and then he left. You know, so, um, yeah, I think it was all ego with Frank. So that's why we kind of like, you know what, fine. If you want to leave, that's cool. I'll, I'll speak to you when I see you, but, yeah, I don't respect you anymore. We all had to do that. Gotcha. At some point, Miguel was running Bodog fight. Frank actually called Miguel about setting up a fight between he and Ken. Obviously, it never never came to fruition. I remember when Miguel called me, we thought, both of us thought it was just kind of like a work or something like that, but yeah, there was legit bad blood between the two of them. Ken would have worked Frank over like he normally did. Like, Frank had this, when it came to Ken, Frank knew that there was no way he could beat Ken. Maybe if Ken got hurt during the match, Maybe that's what he would would have been um, hoping for, but a healthy Ken, he never would have beat it. Well, well, let me let me ask you a little bit more of that because, you know, we've we've done the interviews with Galindo and stuff, and you know, because you have such an extensive background, we've been keeping it professional, but we know Ken kind of, you know, Party. burned the candle at both ends, and yes. Frank when he left Maurice. Yeah, with with Maurice rather, became yeah. a very complete fighter. Do you think he at some point think I'll take my chances with him and and you know, Ken wasn't keeping up? Could he be so, that cocky? I have been. Uh, me and Frank st- kind of stayed in contact. I went to his gym. He asked me to, and I he tried to school me in front of his uh, kids, and ended up getting schooled. So, um, I don't think Frank would have been able to take Ken because if he couldn't okay. take me, no way he would have took Ken. Okay, so in, in in the mental aspects, the big brother, even though they weren't really related, I think the way Frank got blessed into the Lions and initiated, yeah. um, that big brother aspect was probably never going to go away. Okay, right. Plus the fact we all knew. If you hurt Ken, Bob is going to come after you. <laughs> How was your relationship with Bob Shamrock? Um, like I said earlier, Bob didn't like me until I got a six pack. He he thought of me as lazy and, um, you know. And once again, like I said, I had my little Malcolm X symbols. I had my like my couch with on it and. Like, um, they thought that was very disrespectful. Ken thought it was disrespectful. And one day he said, don't bring it back. So I never wore it again out of respect for him because it was his gym. But, um, and once again, like, I really didn't even have the same ideology as Malcolm X. It was more like, I'm wearing this out of disrespect. I hope somebody says something to me. He was the one who said something, but he's my trainer. So okay. I'm not gonna- yeah. All right. So there's actually, and, and this is a little side conversation that we won't go down. There's a book written by the people that were wiretapping Malcolm X, like towards the end of his life. It's one of the most Rough. fascinating reads I have ever had in my life. Malcolm X, he's one of the guys that I'd like to have lunch with. I admire him towards the end of his life. 
It was a rough right. path getting there, but brilliant. Yeah. October 15th, 1994, you fight Matt Hume student, Tom Burthon, and then you roll into a two-day tournament, Pancrase 13. It's December 16th and 17th. Lion's Den, it's a 16-man tournament. Lion's Den has Delusia, Frank, Ken, and yourself all in the same tournament. Your yeah. first opponent is Leon Van Dyke. <laughs> so you want me to do it? <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Leon was uh, one boy. of the protégés. Bad boy. So, yeah. Um, when I, I watched him fight, I'm just like, you know what? I just need to take this guy down and, and not play with him and get it over with. And that's what I did. Like, we did some stand-up. He tried some spinning back fists at me. I snuck underneath it, uh, took him down, and put him in a heel hook. So um, I knew he was tough, but, you know, and I know I have good stand-up, but, you know, he was born into that with Boss, so I wasn't going to play that game. That's smart. It's very smart. And then you come up against a 12-2 and two Funaki. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I knew it was over. <laughs> there, was no, there were no qualms about that. Fanaki was, he just, he was bigger, stronger, more experienced. He outclassed me. Period. It's, it's Funaki. It's 12 and 2 Japan record, which is incredible. Like you've got a 500 Japan record, you're a bad mother jammer. And this guy's 12 and 2. So it just, it speaks volumes of him. Leon Van Go Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. No, well, well, and Fanaki, like you said, also trained me. So he knew my tricks. So, I mean, I'm not going to put anything over on him. No. Um, I, I, I believe in that fight also. Um, I was putting lotion on in the back room, and it was Vaseline intensive care lotion, not slimy stuff. I wanted to look good when I walked out, right? And Fanaki walked in to the room, saw me putting lotion on, and then I remember him. He came back with lotion, puts on his hands and goes. I was like, oh shit. Oh no. <laughs> Cause I had been I had been doing it before and it wasn't a big deal because it wasn't one of those things like sweet sweat where you grab people and you slip out. Yeah. It was just something so my skin wasn't dry. It wasn't like a cocoa butter or something like that. It was just lotion to make me look good under the lights. And he took it as disrespect and yeah, he tore me up that night. <laughs> See, you, you, you said you trained him, and uh, I was wondering. You, we know he's a legend. Mike is talking, you know, twelve and two at this point and stuff. Were you involved with him later on? Like, like what I want to ask is, did you help train him for the Hicks and Gracie fight? Because at the end of the day, he fought Hicks and Gracie. Yeah, no, I did not. He had his okay. own guys or something. I think he he worked with Ken, but yeah, he never worked with us. I don't. I think he didn't want to have one of us catch a lucky heel hook or anything like that and hurt him before his fight. So he only trained with the top notch guys that he felt should be training him. Okay. Leon Van Dyke. He fought Ken later on, and Ken. It looked like he intentionally broke his ankle, and it seemed like there was something personal there. That was a call out to Boss Rutten. He never talked about it. Like, no one, like, it's kind of like one of these questions. Well, I just say it's not like people are clamoring for that answer, but dorks like Miguel and I are. Yes. Yeah, so that's basically a, hey, boss, I just hurt your student. What are you going to do about it? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that's wild. Um, Mark Hall and Ken had an issue. I'm so glad you brought this up. Yes, I'm going to fill in the holes. Go for it. All right. So, from what I understand, to Tony, I shouldn't say understand, Tony Galindo. If, if you listen to the Tony Galindo interview, I did. I listened to the whole thing. Did you listen to the Scott Bissack one? I did not listen to Scott, no. 
Okay, Scott's is equally as crazy. It's equally as crazy as, as, as Tony's. Like, they're, they're, they're two of the same guys. But he said that you guys were watching the door while Ken beat up Mark Hall in a casino bathroom. Can you bring us through from the beginning where the issue started and, you know, bring us through the finish line? All right. So Mark and Ken were trying to set a fight up between them. They're also trying to set up other fights so we could get fights. So Ken, having a much bigger name than Mark, Mark's sponsor, which was some mattress company, cut Mark out of the deal and went to Ken to talk to Ken about um, sponsorships. Okay. So Mark didn't like that. So that's what started this whole thing between Ken and Mark. Is It's like Ken was like, what are you talking about? I didn't call anyone. They called me. They called Ken's wife to try to hook this deal up. So Mark was like, okay, well, we need to talk. And I guess he said some choice words to Tina that Ken didn't like. Ken didn't go into, um, he didn't go into detail about what Mark said, but he, he said, you disrespected my wife, you punk. He said that over the phone to him. So at the King of the Cage, Ken says to me, Watch that guy. He tells Tony, go over there. Hold hold down the fort over there. And I remember this guy was like 300 something. And he was with Mark Hall. And I'm looking at this guy like, do something. <laughs> he wouldn't come in. I, I guess I still. Him in Is it or in a stance? No, this was one of Mark Hall's friends that came with Mark. Where? Super okay. Okay, so it's this bodyguard, and this is in the seating area. This is in the Temecula. This was when they had, it wasn't even a building yet. It was like one of those pop-up tents. And so right by the restroom area, Mark rushed up on Ken, got in Ken's face. Ken starts talking to him, and Mark was like, oh, shit. And then Ken stuck his head right here on Mark to say, what the, you know, they're having their, their words. Mark turns and does this. Ken lost it. So when Mark headbutted Ken, Ken lost it. Put him on the floor. And I remember I was watching and then I thought to myself, oh crap, I need to turn my back to this. Make sure this guy doesn't come in. And this dude never came in. No one came in to help Mark. But he brought dudes. But And I believe at that time I had already had a fight. Yeah, because I fought uh, King of the Cage 2. And I had beat Todd Medina. So I had a name there already. Okay, so this was in the bathroom. They have a fist fight. Not, they didn't even make it in the bathroom. They, it was oh, in the hallway in front of the bathroom. That's why the camera caught it. Okay, but, so Galindo said it was in the bathroom and he was shooing people away from it. It was... It didn't make it into the bathroom because I was standing right there. It was right there in the hallway. They had camera footage of it, but somehow that camera footage disappeared. So we don't know how it disappeared, but yeah, it never made it into the bathroom. That's fair. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> anyone who said that it made it into the bathroom, sorry, it did not. Okay. Okay. And uh, Vernon, Vernon, I appreciate it. everything you've been telling us. Is you know, it's obviously genuine and stuff like that. But are you sure you don't know where those tapes are? Uh, I would like to say I had them because I'd be a rich bastard right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'd be like a highest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Vernon, we need brutal honesty with this question. This is something that this is something that me, Miguel, and Chris Lytle have sent to each other. The picture on the railroad tracks with Ken with his hands out, Robbie Kilpatrick and yourself. Whose idea was that? How does this happen? Oh, my gosh. So um, Ken had been uh, – he had something going with the Max Muscle guys. So they wanted Ken to do a fighter pose. So that's what Ken – came up with was that everyone says he looks like he's riding a horse riding a motorcycle a, we don't know 
I didn't know, but um, I believe the dude who um, took the picture. Do you remember that movie Twin Barbarians? So there was a movie called Twin Barbarians. And one of the guys from that movie was actually the dude who did the photo shoot for Ken and us. Okay. So I can't remember the guy's name, but if you go back and see that movie, Twin Barbarians, it's one of those guys. And they are so weird. They, they laugh like, uh, uh, and you, you <laughs> really, yeah, it's, it's, so for me to meet that guy, I'm like, Hey, put me in the movie. <laughs> And so for those of you guys at home, like sometimes celebrities have like headshots or you know that they kind of send around. This became the lion's den, like headshot, so to say. And yeah. it, it went viral before that word even existed. Yeah. I still have some of those uh Max Muscle magazines with those pictures in it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Well, one more question in regards to the wardrobe of, of, of the Lion's Den. I can't remember what UFC it was, but you guys had berets and camouflage pants on. Yeah. Uh, Where does that, that come Max from? Muscle. Max Muscle. Um, Same thing? Yeah. They, uh, and I believe Ken. And Robbie started that whole beret thing. Robbie used to sleep in his damn beret. Like, I'd come home and that dude would be walking to the bathroom in that damn thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think he was even with his girlfriend taking pictures like, the, what was that movie, American Psycho? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Did you get along with Takafumi Ito? Yeah, I had no problems with him. Um then we had to fight, and yeah, he was just like a little freaking bumblebee. Yeah. Did any no of these problem. Japanese guys, did they ever come out of their shell and warm up and want to hang out with you guys, or did they just pretty much stay with the the local pancreas guys? Because of the language barrier, um, we tried to learn as much Japanese as we could, so it would, uh, so they would feel more comfortable talking to us. And some of them learned more English so they could talk to us. And um, yeah, I, I never felt like, like I say, I never felt disrespected by any of them. When they would get alcohol in them, though, they would start talking a little bit better English. So <laughs> yeah, there's no inhibitions. Like if they screwed up a word, we'd be like, oh no, I think you meant this. And the same thing for them with us. Like I would say something in Japanese, they'd be like, uh, no, I think you mean this. <laughs> That's Sorry, cool. So yeah. Mike, are we gonna? I, I don't know if we're gonna get to it, so I'm gonna jump to it because were you with Ken by the time he broke into Pride? And uh, I'm talking about the famous Pete in My Heart, uh, you know, where he had Pete in the corner, and uh, you know, Ken Tony Galindo said Ken had a heart attack in the ring. How, how do you how do in, you see in, that? What was your insight? Um, he had been having heart problems. Um, he was actually in the hospital for like a week with uh, palpitations. So, and that was no prior joke. or post. Um, before. Yeah, Jesus. he was having problems in the WWE with his heart, and they actually had him in the hospital. Um, no one told us where he were where he was, so I couldn't even go visit him to see if he was okay. So, yeah, like he had been having heart issues for a while. So wow. Jason DeLucia, his belief was that Ken was poisoned. Uh, I don't know what Scott the Sack said, but I know Tony believed that it was stress because Ken broke up with a girlfriend. Um, I don't think it was poison, but, yeah, Ken stressed himself a lot. Um. That's one of the reasons why he brought Bob back in because like um, I, I heard him, he started going through money problems because his wife was spending so much dang money that as fast as he was making it, she was spending it. Oh my God. Yeah. So yeah, the dude was stressed and he's got to go out and fight people and you know, he's got to keep up his, he's got to keep his body up, you know? Plus, he's taking drugs, and yeah, he just, 
he lost it for a while. Now, was one of the things now you mentioned Tina, and and I knew his wife's yeah. name was one of his wives was named Tina. Yeah. And uh, when he broke up with Tina, oh, Tina went and managed Tito and Tiki and and that crew there. She actually tried dabbling in MMA management. How did that affect Ken? Um, I mean, he had to separate himself. He had to, he, he had to, you know, it's not like he could just be like, because he, he had kids with her, you know, you can't bad mouth your, your kid's mom, no matter how much you might hate her at the time, you can't bad mouth her because then, you know, it, it'll draw a wedge between him and the kids. So, um, I think he did what every dude with an ego would, he shoved it inside and, uh, just dealt with it, you know? Um, he didn't want anything else to do with her, but she, she was vindictive. Like she did a lot of stuff to Ken, um, like taking his Corvette, you know, stuff like that. She was telling him, I need a car. And she took that car from him, you know? So, um, yeah, she was no angel. So I understand that Ken did a lot of stuff, but yeah, she was no angel either. I, I remember them coming in the gym and fighting and then Ken would be like, burn it. Get your shoes. Get in the ring. I'm like, oh, I hate, you. I hate you. Don't ever come back to the gym again. <laughs> and then after me, then Tony, it's your turn. Get in the gym. Like 20 minutes, just beat down. You know, and, and he would go down the line because of her. I'm like, even oh. Jason, like, everybody were like, oh, my God, Tony is here. Something's wrong. Why? Why? So, I mean, yeah, nobody really liked her. Now, now that's amazing. You said she was vindictive. I mean, and yeah. she and he also had her manage you and, and some of the other fighters. So now she breaks up and she goes and manages Tito. Yeah. Well, that that's that's the caveat Crazy. with Tito. Like people always, you know, the Ken, Tito, you know, Ken obviously was past his prime at the time and Tito took full advantage of it. But where people ignore is where that fight started, like where the seed that got watered, and it's more likely than not that right there. Well, no, that really because, uh, Tito beat Guy. Yeah, and when Tito beat Guy, he gave the two fingers to Guy. T Ken thought Tito gave them to him. So whether or not he did, I don't know because I wasn't I wasn't ringside, but I did see him do his little thing. And then Ken was like, you son of a it just he lost his shit in the ring. And that's how it started. And then Tito was like, Yeah, I wasn't doing it to him, I was doing it to Guy. And but if he wants the problem, we can get it. And that's how it started. So Tina was that, Tina that's prior the, to that or after that? So Tina Way after Ken, so after the first fight, I I don't remember exactly when they broke up, but it was after they broke up, and Ken had already fought Tito. Is when she oh started. Oh my god! After Tito, yeah. Oh my god! It was Tito's way of also putting the screws into Ken. Like, yeah, you're actually. Oh, you have to. Oh. I, and, you know, so I mean. And I'm sure she was doing more than managing him because she that's her way of getting back at Ken. Well, if some guy that you've got an issue with ex-wife calls and wants to do business with you, I mean, you're 100% of the time going to take her up on it. And made money. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, right. and like I say, I'm sure there were some back room dealings going on between Tito and Tina as well. Because she was not known for, um, you know, they both cheated. So I'm sure Tito was in there doing some stuff he sh probably shouldn't have been doing with Ken's ex-wife. Just oh. as stick it to Ken. So, Miguel, this is what we refer to as a segue. So <laughs> with Tony Galindo, he talked about an instance. Well, you know, like, like Ken was always on the road. She's got needs. It's neither, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't find joy in any of that. But there was an instance where Ken called both you and Tony to the bar to talk about some of her dalliances. Yeah, talking was the last thing on his mind. 
he calls me up like two o'clock in the morning and says, I need you to come down to the bar right now and bring your wrestling shoes. So I'm perplexed. <laughs> I'm like, for fucking what? Right? I, wake me up out of a sleep. So I get dressed, I bring my shoes. You know? And, and I And you've got a full time job. Huh? You got a you got a full time job at this point. I have well, no, I was um I was working at the gym and then I was doing um bouncing on the weekend. Okay. Uh, yes. and also stripping on the weekend. And uh yeah, it was right and I had a fight coming up with Todd Medina. So it was right before that. And um yeah, Ken brings me down to the he had just been beating up on Tony. Like he was slapping Tony around. So I get there. Tony's like a, a little whooped kid, like got his head down, won't look me in the face. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Did you fuck my wife? Seriously? Why would you ask me? And then he came at me. And when he came at me, I did this and he kneed me in the thigh. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I hate your wife. The only reason I talk to your wife is because you make me talk to your wife. You know? And and then he backed off after that. And I don't know. I guess he had a moment of clarity. But, yeah, he was uh, – in his mind, he, me and Tony had had sex with his wife. But I had, I had dropped Tony off. So she couldn't say that she did something with Tony. Then I took her home and I dropped her off. That's how much I hated her. But we had gone down to Mexico and um, me and Tony, we were in Baby Rock. And I remember me and Tony were sitting there nodding off. And then next thing you know, I get a grab on my hand. She grabbed my hand and put it on her breast. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? like you know you can't be doing that so but yeah it's like that was i don't know if she was just doing it she did it to both of us to to wake us up i'm like that's not something that i want ever to happen i, I mean this woman she had this weird skin thing and like she was allergic to her sweat so she looked like an alligator bag she was not attractive to me. Not attractive at all, in the least bit. So, but that was Ken's wife, and I, I respected Ken, so I had to give her that respect, too. Uh, I wanted to cuss her up one side and down the other, but then I didn't want Ken to come back and get mad at me because I cussed his wife out because she was trying to hit on me. You know, so I was, and I never you did that. You were back in a hard place. Either way, yeah. you were wrong. Either way, yeah, you were exactly. wrong. Exactly. So, I and... That's why I'm the way I am now. Like, I don't even like hugging other people's wives because that crap happened. You know? Yo, man. I'm with crazy. you on that, bro. I'm with you on that. Like, I, I do a lot of promotions here. I don't even touch ring girls. Don't even talk to them. I don't even want. It's just a whisper of that stuff. No, -uh. yeah. no I'll pass on that. All right. You beat Larry Papadopoulos by heel hook. Your leg game from what I am told it is like through the roof at this point, where did you pick up? Like, where are you doing the math equations at and how to improve your, uh, your leg attacks? So, um, when Oleg Taktarov came in, right. So Oleg, basically he started showing us not to mention the fact that Oleg was a freaking brick. Like everything was like, you know, he was on some juice. So he taught us different ways of doing the Achilles where you're actually lifting up and then you're, then you're doing the, the tweaking of the elbows and then the body and you're lifting up. When he showed that, then I remember him and Ken got into it and I watched him grab Ken's heel and I'd never seen Ken move that fast. Ken spun out of it. And then I was like, ooh, there's something to what Oleg is saying. And I started doing that. Then with the heel hooks, I started pulling the heel hook in. And then I actually started doing the way Oleg was teaching us. And then Ken even 
revamped his style of how to do heel hooks, that's when he started breaking people's legs. Okay. It's, it's just for everybody at home. All right. We're doing right now, we've got a little thing on Gerald Strebent, the Raphael Tory, Tory murder tapes. I got a hold of them. We're releasing them. So we're hoping to get Gerald Strebent on a future show. While I'm going through Gerald Strebent's record, or going through his fights, he fights Santino DeFranco. Mm -hmm. And in the front row, I see Vernon Tiger White. <laughs> and Gerald's going through for a leg lock. And you hear something for the audience. And it's you. I don't know what's being said. You yell it again. And in essence, you said, leg on your belly. I know what you're trying to do. Leg on a belly, bump your hips. Mm -hmm. And Gerald goes, I called up Strevent. I tracked his phone number down and he goes, oh, dude, Vernon White. No, bro. His leg lock game is through the, through the roof. He coached me through on how to finish Santino DeFranco, who's a fantastic UFC trainer right now, I might, I might add. And Vernon guided me through it. He's like, the reason I won that fight is because of Vernon Tiger White. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> so you're, you're very well respected in the jujitsu community in regards to your leg attacks. Okay. Yeah, they keep trying to get me to come back. I'm just – I'm too old to be going in there with these youngsters trying to – yeah, I, I got to worry about my career now. But, yeah, <laughs> I've had a bunch of offers to do seminars and to roll with people. And, it's, it's yeah, it's not worth it to me anymore. Okay, so you're completely out of the gym then, huh? No, I still work out every now and then. Sometimes I, I, I'll go to the gym two times a week and just work out. But for the most part, I work out at home. Um, okay. My new job actually has a gym in it, so sometimes I'll do just body workout stuff there. And, like, there's a couple of people there that I work out with me. And, uh, yeah, we're just doing weights, just lifting. I think one of the most puzzling things when I look at the beginning of your career, something that kind of makes me scratch my head, is your fight with uh, Gregory Smith. It took place July 22nd, 1995, Pancreas 20. Uh, that was a screw-up. I was playing around. Not with Greg, but before the fight, like, I was, there was, I was in Japan. Like, there was a bunch of Japanese girls there, uh, there was a bunch of drugs there, and yeah, um, I did not take Gregory Schmidt seriously, and um, I screwed up because I didn't go into that fight mentally prepared to fight Gregory Schmidt because I thought it was going to be a walkthrough, and it wasn't. That's God's yeah. honest truth. Yeah, that's that's interesting. People, um, there's a couple comments online going. It doesn't look fixed. It doesn't look fake, but how's Tiger White losing to that? I, I, was it the Lions Den lifestyle that just kind of caught up to you at that moment? Well, we were training in Japan together. It was me, Greg, and Boss. We were training in Japan together. And um, like he he knew my moves, he knew all that stuff. And like I said, like I had got this new Japanese girlfriend, like she was taking me out, buying me twelve hundred dollars sunglasses, you know. <laughs> Um, we we're also going out and like she had, she used to hang out. I guess she said um, um, she used to go to parties with uh, what's the, the matrix guy, uh, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> yeah. And she had pictures of her with Keanu Reeves and like, she was the editor of a magazine and she used to go to parties with Keanu Reeves. So I'm hanging out with this chick and yeah, she got me on E and stuff like that. And yeah, like I said, I was not taking that fight seriously at all. I thought I was going to walk through it. And, um, yeah, I was I was doing stupid stuff that I should not have been doing. Did you ever fight on ecstasy? There was uh, – when I fought in um, – <laughs> I fought one of uh, Couture's guys, and uh, it was in um, – JT Taylor? No, uh, what was, what was, not burger. The the one kid that they say has the retard strength, I can't remember what his name oh, is. Oh, I know. Like that. No, Norwood. Uh, Matt Norwich. 
Horwich, yes. So the night before the fight with Matt Horwich, um, my my wife at this time didn't even know, but I was doing lines of cocaine in the bathroom. And uh, yeah, that was the dumbest thing I had ever done. But during the fight, um, I felt freaking great. And um, I was actually beating him down and uh, I hit him with an illegal blow. And I believe I kneed him in the face while he was on the ground or, or I went to kick him while he was on the ground. And I didn't realize because I'm caught up in the moment because I got these drugs in my head. Next thing you know, I was like, shit, I don't want to do that again. So I dialed it back. When I dialed it back, he turned it up. And I remember while I was actually hitting him, I heard his mom in the audience scream, please don't hurt my boy. And then he squealed. He made this, I hit him, he goes, ee! he made this noise. I'm like, what? and that messed me up too. I'm like, what the hell? And because if that happens, the ref is actually supposed to step in and stop the fight because that's like a verbal um, a verbal submission. Submission. Like, yeah. It's, it's, he's verbally going, ah, I'm getting my butt kicked, you know? But it didn't happen, and I kept fighting. So, yeah, it just so, – after that, I'm like – then I got this in my head, please don't hurt my son, and I'm like, how do I handle that? And I wasn't in my right mind. So – your senses were a little bit tweaked from the activities that you were participating in the night and before. you're just absorbing everything. Absorbing <laughs> everything. Yeah. It was like that. Actually, it was like that in Brazil. I, um, I was having a fight with Keith Bessems and um, I remember the, um, the commentators, they were so close to the ring. The guy called me Tiger Woods and in the middle of hitting this guy, I look up and I'm like, Tiger White. <laughs> <laughs> Tiger White. You know, I'm lipping Tiger White. And he was like, you hurt me? Like, after the fight, he was like, you heard me say Tiger Woods? I'm like, yeah. Don't mess my name up while I'm in the middle of a fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, yeah. my God. That's yeah. frightening. That's actually frightening. <laughs> yeah. All right. One of the interesting things that I don't think has ever been addressed is December 14th, 1995, Pancreas 24, you fight fellow Lions Den member, Frank Shamrock. Was this when Ken was trying to push Frank out? Yeah, it, I think it was one of those things where if Frank lost to me, he was going to let me take over the Lions Den. Um, but... Frank had just learned a new move from Fanaki that night. And he beat me with it. Oh, I was no. so mad. Yeah, because right before that, right before he beat me, I kid you not, in the middle of the ring, Frank goes, Vern, which corner is mine? Because I hit him so hard, he didn't know which corner was his. So in desperation, he used this this hole that Fanaki showed him and beat me. Frank was a genius. He was, he's a prodigy at, at figuring things out. He really is. He's not yeah. even a good wrestler, but yeah. his takedowns are fantastic. And he beat wrestlers using wrestling. It's and, and friggin' crazy. Frank also got so, it was after that fight that I really started using um, steroids. Cause I was like, I will never lose to Frank again, ever. And because he got so strong, him and Ken both. And I'm like, dude, put the brother up. I, I want to get stronger, you know? <laughs> and like I said, I was tired of him. I was tired of like, and then he had this chip on his shoulder with me afterwards, after he won that fight. So, yeah. And I promised myself, even in training, I'm not going to freaking lose to this guy again. But I wow. did. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and we were going back and forth. So, did you guys find out you were fighting there, or were you guys both training to fight each other? Fighting separately. So Ken told us a month in advance, so we would not train at the same time in the gym. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't, I can't figure Ken out. Like, I don't yeah. know if he's toxic, and he's just. 
trying to create problems or I don't know if there's like some sort of finish line that's brilliant. I, I can't I can't see up or down with him. I, I think his thing is just showing that none of us are afraid to fight anybody. You know, like he he always said, I like the fact that you'll fight anybody. But there were some people like he wouldn't let me fight. And I'm like, I don't understand that. So, yeah, it, Ken was hard to read sometimes. Like I yes. said, I went to Takahashi. Oh, you're not ready for Takahashi. And I went out there and I beat him twice <clears throat> when we finally did fight. Yeah. Yeah. What about fake black belt Alex Silva Rua, Huas? So Alex, I don't know too much about him. Yeah, he, he showed up in. at Lions then, though, correct? He did, and um, and he got uh, like some. Was it? Uh, yeah, some Jesus of the Christ. guys that we, that we fought with, they ran over and started punching him in the face. So this is what happened. We had this this um, show in Stockton, and somehow I end up fighting. Three dudes. So the dude Wait, that I hey, can I fighting, set the table on this one? Let me set the table on this one so kind of catch people up because this is amazing. 1998, MMA is illegal in California. This gentleman right here goes over to Main Street Gym in Stockton and ends up in a tournament, unbeknownst to yourself, until you show up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly what it was. And I'm fighting, I'm fighting, so I fought, I ended up fighting three people. So the dude that they had me fight in my fourth fight had one fight. So Gil I'm Castillo. Fighting. Yes. He had one fight. And so then I ended up fighting him. I, and I actually fought another one of their guys. It was some black dude that was a Gracie guy. And um, yeah, I beat him bad. I beat him so bad that, yeah, they were just, they were angry. So after Castillo beats me with an armbar, huh? Armbar. Yeah. After he beats me, they run over to our corner and start punching Alex in the face. So he tried to break my arm, but he couldn't break it. And I ended up tapping anyway, but I'm looking going, what? Yeah, I'm not getting in it. I don't know what it is, but I'm not getting in it. And then somebody, I remember one of their guys jumped in the ring at me. So I'm like, all right, it's time to get in it. And I put my hands up and I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. So, yeah, it was a, it was a bad night that night. So it was Caesar Gracie and the beginnings of the scrap pack. So from what I gather, my research, Alex Silva Ruas. Okay. At this time in mixed martial arts, the, the, like we had, who did we talk to we talked to Liborio he said there was the plane ride black belts they would leave they would be blue belts in Brazil and by the time they landed wherever it is they were going they were black belts because nobody knew it <laughs> so who else okay. fell into this category he said no I'm related to king of the streets I'm this I'm that yeah Caesar Gracie went out of his way to attack him because he knew he was lying and oh. that's with, so Caesar throws him out of the gym. He winds up over with you guys. And I think he was with you guys for about a week prior to this taking place. And yeah. did you guys ever see him again after that? No, he left. <laughs> he left. Which was fine. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, if somebody came over to my side of the ring and started punching me through the ropes... I would have come unglued and came inside the ring with him. He didn't. So, I mean, that kind of showed us, you know, yeah, he might not be who he says he is. <laughs> and the Caesar Gracie guys, they just, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, well was, was there a rivalry there? Because... It, it yeah. was, or was that you fighting Dave Terrell? Because you fought Dave Terrell, who's from that group, too. Yes. Yeah, I did fight Dave Terrell. And I fought was him that, in... How did that rivalry start? Um, 
Honestly, I don't know. I think it was because Ken had a, a rivalry with uh, Hoist. So, like, all the Gracies, like, the Lions then was the team to beat because, like, Ken and Hoist hated each other. So, yeah, people started targeting us. And, yeah, it was an IFC match. And uh, I was actually the champion for the IFC. And Dave Terrell decided he wanted to come in and challenge me, talking trash. And uh, I was being – I'm fighting him. We're fighting. Next thing you know, he gets out, starts kneeing me in the back of the head. And uh, that pissed me off. And I remember after that happened, for the rest of the fight, he never got on top again. And I beat him. Didn't want to submit him. I just – I beat him until my hands, like, swelled. Like, I let him wear these ear protectors because he had surgery on his ear. And I remember cracking – those ear protectors, like the headgear, I was, you could hear it. And the, the audience is like, oh my God, they're like screaming. And um, yeah, I, I beat that dude for the whole fight. There was nothing he could say about it. Yeah, he had the wrestling headgear on. Yeah. What about, uh, what I, about him, I let him wear them. She, he said, okay, I had surgery. Will you let me wear headgear? I said, fine, let me wear shoes. Okay. He was that he was that confident that he was going to beat me. And yeah, he ended up getting spanked for that whole fight for the rest of the time. What about crazy Bob Cook? What was working out with him like? So yeah, Bob came in as a, uh, first as a student, then as a young boy. And um, I don't know what transpired between uh, Bob and Frank, but uh, Bob and Frank, they were, friends for a while and then all of a sudden then bob left and then some fighters left with bob so um i wasn't really in on that i don't know exactly what happened but yeah he left and started his own fight group it's called shamrock 2000 okay yeah. but yeah then, then him and frank stopped talking from what i gather and um i could be wrong but yeah. You mentioned then, Takahashi. Huh? You mentioned Takahashi, Kazu Takahashi, who is a Japanese legend. You fought yeah. him in a four-man tournament April 7th, 1996. You fight Takahashi, who's got a win over Scott Basak. And then you, Yanagasawa, you run into Yanagasawa. So you went one and one that night. Good showing. You made it to the finals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yanagisawa just, uh, yeah, he was ready for me that night. So um, I, I put it all out on the table for uh, Takahashi because Takahashi had a an awesome fight with Ken. Like, he stood up with Ken, and I'm like, yep, that's who I want to fight. I, I, I want to fight him more than anybody else here because he was that tough that I felt like if I could beat him, it should cement my name. Because I know I wasn't beating Suzuki. I didn't beat Suzuki until after Guy beat him. So, like, he was on a downward spiral. And, uh, yeah, Takahashi was, like, in my crosshairs after watching him fight Ken. Well, you certainly leveled up there. And this is towards the end of your pancreas run. So, you beat Takahashi. You lose to Yanagisawa, 1247 by ankle lock. And, and you went the full 20 minutes against Takahashi. Like you, you had almost, you know, 45 minutes of fighting that night. You draw against Fuke. So a guy that's consistently beat you, now you're getting draws. So like, dude, your levels are, you're in a different gear. You lose to Funaki with an ankle lock, but Suzuki, you win a decision. He's, I mean, Suzuki's obviously a legend. And then yeah. in your last fight, you get Takahashi again. Yeah. Ended I mean, him with a head kick. Roster. <laughs> yeah, dude, savages. And you ended him with a head kick. You're finishing now. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, I got tired of getting pushed around, you know? Um, it's just I don't I don't remember. I just remember hearing, put your combinations together. And that's what I did. I put my combinations together. Hold him back, hold him off, keep him at a distance, kick, keep him at a distance, low kick, high kick. And, yeah, uh, 
everything just came together for me that night. What about um, at some point you switched management to Phyllis Lee? Me? Yes. Never. No? Never? Okay. Thank you. Nope. She uh, was with... Uh, and Sam. Yeah. Coleman. Yeah. And I think they wanted me to come over there. But yeah. No, I never... She she was doing Pancrase and she was bringing fighters over for Pancrase because she was taking Ken's spot. And they wanted me to switch over to her. And I said no. And that ended my career with Pancrase. Okay, so Ken and Pancrase founders have a falling out. Do we as do you know the reason because of that? Um I I think it's because uh Ken wanted to leave and get out of there and do UFC. And um, they weren't liking the fact that uh, he was doing UFC and he had a contract. So they basically, I believe they let him out of his contract and then he <laughs> he never came back. So I think that it was, to them, it was unfinished business. But to Ken, it was like, no, nah, I'm done. I'm, I'm over, you know? And he sure. let us stay going there because it was like, yeah, you guys need to make money. Stay there and make money. So, Miguel, one of our favorite interviews is our first of a Cinesec one where he fights in UFC, UFC Australia. That was the title name of the event, but it was actually a fraudulent name with a fake, like, I should, I'm not going to say it's a fake event because it was real. It was the first one in Australia but people legitimately thought that they were fighting for the UFC. Yeah. This man right here fought on that card as well. <laughs> so it was the Australasian UFC. Yeah. And they even, <laughs> yeah, they even bit off of the character hitting the earth with his hands. So and I still have those, uh, I still have that uh, t-shirt. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Elvis fought Matthew Rocca, which was one of our guys from Canada. So, and yeah, and I fought Alan Goez on that match. Mario Sperry? Mario. Oh, yes. I fought Mario Sperry. My bad. Alan Goez was pride. Yeah. 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 So, so Mario Sperry, even Mario Sperry at the time thought he was fighting for the UFC. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I knew better because they actually came, they had a lawyer go and try to shut it down. Ken told me. They said, there's somebody out there right now trying to shut this down from the UFC. Yeah. And that was yeah, one of the it, reasons why. It cost, he's, I think it, when I read it, it cost the guy a couple hundred grand. But to his credit, he pulled the event off. He still did yeah. it. He never backed yeah. out. Yep. Yep. And I think they called me and Mario's fight the war on the floor. And we got the fight of the night. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, the funny thing is, is I remember Mario laying on the cot, getting his lips his lips stitched up because I busted his lip open. Yeah, um, you fought a ton of legends. Uh, you you're, you're, you mentioned Pride, and your first taste of Pride was against a guy who's pretty good named Sakuraba. Well, Sakuraba was my second fight. Alan Goez was my first fight. Yeah. So I okay. fought Alan. And we went all the way to the end, and then he won by decision. Then I fought Sakuraba, and um, I believe Ken was supposed to fight Sakuraba, but I ended up fighting him first, and then Ken fought him. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. And you, uh, you, you've, you've literally been around, and you've also had some really interesting relationships one of which is Cedric Marks, a guy that got picked up for murder and is on trial now for like a, a couple additional extra murders. Yeah. Um, did you think he was a serial killer when you met him? No, no. We we shared cabs going to Rapungi and we're having we're like sharing stories back and forth about stuff, man. Uh, yeah, I never would have thought that in a million years. He seemed like he had his his stuff together. 
Real funny guy, too. Funny yeah. guy. Yeah. Like, quick wit. They say serial killers can be charming. Yeah. In the Lion's Den Dojo fights, did you fight Roland Payne or Zane Frazier? I did fight Zane Frazier. Roland Payne, he, I think he was a kickboxer. Yeah, and he Ken, fought like Ken, Orlando Wheat. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, I think Ken fought him. And then I think I fought, I boxed him or kickboxed him after Ken. But yeah, uh, Zane Frazier, um, I remember he came in so cocky. You know, I fought Frank Dukes and I beat Frank Dukes. I'm like, what? You fought Frank Dukes? Oh, cool. This should be a good fight then. So um, first thing off, he sticks his finger in my eye. I'm like, what, what the hell is wrong with you, dude? Like, he flicks his hand out just like this with his fingers open right Oof. in my eyes. And I'm like, what are you doing? So after that, that pissed me off. And yeah, his initiation was rough after that. Like, I put submission after submission after submission on him. Um, I was trying to get him to quit, but, uh, yeah, Ken wanted him to stay. He didn't end up staying for long because he knew no one liked him after that. It's like you you come into the gym and you're talking all this trash, how you beat Frank Dukes and a move, somebody that a movie was made about and you can't even go with a young boy? Get out of here. You know, Miguel, when you look at his record, it's obviously filled with legends. But one of the things, and we're wrapping up right now, one of the things that, that impresses the hardcore fans the most, I shouldn't say the hardcore fans, the people that are in the gyms, like the locker room talk, was James Lee. James Lee at the time, these two fought, was out of Michigan, but he would train with like Rampage, Chuck, and Tito, uh, with I think it was a Sean Solis, and he would piece those guys up. So yeah, I never knew that. When these two fought, okay, when these two fought, King of the Cage introduced their champion, this gentleman right here, first, which is an absolute insult. And then they had James Lee come in second. Like it just told you, they insulted the shit out of their champion, and they brought a guy in that they're like they thought for sure they were wrapping their belt around. And Rampage even publicly said, "Man, this one's going to be ugly." <laughs> yeah i mean ken was like you need to go out and you need to handle business no playing around yeah. and i did yeah you did fantastic finish yeah. them did you finish them or was it a was it a decision um Maybe a decision no it wasn't a decision i yeah i, I finished him okay and i remember uh yeah they uh what he had told me, yeah, because uh, James told me that he was really good friends with Terry and that Terry wanted him to beat me. Terry so, Trouble Guy. Yeah. Terry oh, wanted him sure. to take the belt from me. Yeah. So, but I was like, whatever. When I lose the belt, I lose the belt. So, but yeah, I I, I actually made friends with uh, James after that. So I went out to his gym and I actually did a, uh, a seminar for some of his people. So, so, yeah, there was no harsh feelings between us. I still talk to him every now and then. No, but he's, I, he's he's doing really good. He's got a yeah, he's got this a uh, uh, a house in Thailand on the beach that he keeps trying to invite me to, but I'm trying to tell him I'm married. I can't go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the thing is, it's uh, King of the Cage. I don't think they, for some reason, they never appreciated. Either Lion's Den or that of yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't forget we were cocky. So, I mean, I mean, Terry made a whole show around us once, and I wasn't on that show because I was a headliner myself. But it was Guy, I believe Guy, Trey, Pete, Tony. And I was the only one who didn't fight on that show because I had a fight coming up and I was the headline. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what happened, why he started disliking us. But like I said, yeah, people people's heads got in the clouds there for a, a while. And I, I have to admit, I was one of them. Like, even my first fight there, I said, you don't know who I am, but by the time I'm done, you will know who I am. You'll know my name. I was that cocky. So... 
Why do you think Crazy Bob Cook left with Frank Shamrock? Um, once again, I don't know. Um, okay. I, I just know that, uh, like I said, they were, they were friends. They were tight. And um, then I heard about them splitting up, and then he went to Javier Mendez's place. So, I don't know. Frank doesn't, like, he's not very good at friendships. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened with that situation. I can see that. And then I'll close with this. The Mark Coleman, Ken Shamrock sparring sessions. Were you present? <laughs> For some of them, yes. When they were like, Ken had this thing that he would do. He would shut the gym. When Mark came in, him and Mark went at it. It's like the Bruce Lee thing. No one knew what happened. It was them two. They fought and then no one talked about it. He did the same thing with Oleg. Closed the gym. Only that time with Oleg, we were there. And we got to see Ken messed up Oleg pretty bad, cut his eye open. But yeah, um, Ken did not like to... What's the word I'm looking for? He did not look like, like, like the lesser of the two in front of his students? No, he didn't want to diminish the other people because he beat them. You know what I'm saying? Unless it was money to be made. Then, yeah, he's going to make you look as bad as he possibly can. But, yeah, when he shut that door, yeah, it was – it's you and him, man on man. Uh, nobody talks about it after you're done. Coleman claims he knocked Ken out. I wasn't Ken there to see it. he knocked Coleman out. <laughs> <laughs> So who's really going to know? Because it was just those two in the gym. Yeah. I, I've interviewed Ken before. Um, on a, it, it's on YouTube. It's got quite a few hits. He's a – why were you so loyal to him? Like, what, what made you – we've had several people that said if, if Vernon Tiger White leaves Ken Shamrock, he's a – if he doesn't have a belt around his waist as a world champion in the UFC or pride, he's damn near close. He's absolutely in the conversation. What, what, what made you stay with him? Respect and loyalty. Even though all the stuff that happened, I was loyal to a fault. I will say that now. I was loyal to a fault. Um, and I think Ken knew that. So that's why he never really worried about me. But, um, yeah, there was times that I thought about leaving, and then I thought to myself, you know, where where else am I going to go that I get this training, and I don't have to relocate, you know? So I basically I stayed there because it was it was convenient. Yeah. Do you think your upbringing? Yeah, yeah. Do you think it, your upbringing? It's a big deal, you know. Unless you break into the top echelon of pay, it really is a big factor. We the last interview we did was. Uh, uh, Jason Knight, who's a had a major bare knuckle fight and stuff like that, but he said the same thing. He said, "I stayed in Mississippi because you know my wife, my kid, my job. You know, I I had everything there. I couldn't go to American Top Team. I couldn't do it. So unless you break into that top, you kind of got you get you get shuffled into. Does that yeah. give you? Does that make you? You know, when you're home, do, do you have some resentment over that? Or do you look back at it like what could have been? Or are you happy, you know, satisfied overall? I mean, you still did amazing things, amazing oh, groundbreaking sure. stuff. But do you sometimes think like you got held back? Sometimes I feel like it. Yeah. Um, but I also know that Ken did things for a reason. So I don't know what his reasoning was. Maybe he thought I wasn't ready. But but when I did finally blossom, like, I mean, look at, I, I beat Todd Medina. Todd Medina went to Russia, and he, he won a, 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 a tournament in Russia. And then he comes over, and I knock him out nine seconds, you know? So, I mean, there was a little bit of method to Ken's madness. So I, I respect the fact that he was trying to protect me a little bit. But, yeah, I feel like, there's a lot more that I could have done had I been somewhere else. 
Yeah, you know, you say that you also did a lot. You also did a lot. Like, yeah, I mean, dude, dude first pancreas, first UFC. You know, you were at the were you at the first Pride? I know you fought in the second Pride, but were you actually in a corner? Yeah, it was all of us. The whole den was there. Ken fought the uh, Machida, not Machida, uh, Fujita. I mean, yeah, you've been to over a dozen countries. You've been to Japan over thirty times. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I, I, I loved it. I loved it. I, I thought, if anything, you were just going to stay in Japan. You know, I almost like uh, I I met a girl and I almost wanted to marry her. Um, but then I came to my senses and came home and my family's here. You know, I, I would have left my sister. And plus the fact that Japan isn't that uh, keen on people marrying and then uh, staying in their country. Like they even I don't know if Jerry Bolander told you the story, but. We were supposed to be going, I believe it was Okinawa. Jerry was supposed to have a fight there. They never let us out of the airport. And this pissed me off about Jerry, and I never wanted to work with Jerry again after this. The The Japanese guys, they pulled us in, they put us in a little room, and they kept us in this room for 21 hours. 21 hours until the next flight leaving from Japan was going back to America. Jerry got so upset for most of the time he was screaming, this is why we bombed you in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you motherfuckers. I'm like, Jerry, they're going to fucking put bamboo shoots up our fingernails and fucking kill us. <laughs> Knock that shit off. What was the reason that they weren't letting you out of the, uh, the airport? They said something with our visa wasn't right. So they didn't let us in. But the funny thing is, is when Jerry wasn't there, we never had any problems. I think maybe they didn't like Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's possible. It's possible. Vernon, uh, first off, Tony Glindo hooked us up. Um, I'm really glad that you weren't hesitant based on the interview with Tony, which is off the wall crazy. But we <laughs> sincerely, sincerely appreciate you coming on. And we've got the utmost respect for yourself and your career. Thank you very much. And yeah, when I saw the video with Tony, the interview with Tony, I said, Tony, give the guys my number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've got some stuff that I know that you got wrong and I need to set it right. <laughs> what a cool I, 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 Yep. As we end no, here, like, I just. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, but as you know, you guys had to correct me a couple times too. So there were some things that I got wrong as well. No, no, we appreciate it. Like I, all I want here at the end of the interview is I, I got to get a promise from you to come back because we still got like this much of your career left to go over. Dude, we and got stuff. Brazil. We got the pride. Brazil. There's so much more. You even did like a like a, a one stint your ADCC where you did jujitsu, K1 where you did K1. You did, yeah. obviously, MMA, UFC, and Pride. And then I think there's one way. You got submission grappling, MMA. Don't forget the Tropicana and Ken show. And K you got K1, ADCC, MMA. I think you're the one person that participated in three or four different organizations and played under their rule set. Yeah, the, yeah. the WVC he was in was full headbutts. Yeah, in WWE, it's like people have done multiple organizations, but they've done like MMA in K1. You fought K1 rules in K1. Yeah. So Where it's just it's an absolute yeah. pioneer, man. Let me go. We got it. Vernon, please. We've got so much more of your career left. Like you've got about 70 fights on record. You probably got another 15 that aren't listed. Yeah. Well, when I tell people I've had over 80 professional fights and one of my fights, I actually did seven fights in one night in Scotland. They were Pancray style. Four of them were Pancray style. The other three were karate style. All yeah. in one night. 
He also went to Sweden for an amateur fight. You know, yeah. what do you get about <laughs> 50 let me punch the guy on the ground. It's friggin' nuts, dude. Your career is crazy. <laughs> you're well spoken. You know, you're, you've got clear head. And man, do we got a ton of respect for you? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, yeah, just let me know when you want me to come back. Two weeks. Thank we're having you having back. Sir. Two <laughs> weeks. We'll start the new year off with you, brother. Thank you, sir. Well, Mike, we are uh, digging into the lion's den, and uh, we got another one in the books, and this is a major one in terms of, you know, Vernon was there from the very beginning, and as he mentioned, till 2010, he was there, you know, till the end. So I don't even think we got to the tip of the iceberg in this one, and, and uh, two hours plus. Well, here, we've got a little bit of a plan. So this this interview comes by way of Tony Galindo. 100% it was him. In fact, he's lining up other Lions Den members as we speak and almost strong arming them over our way, which, man, I'm okay with that. So, with Vernon, as crazy as Tony and Scott Bissack's interviews were in regards to the Den, we didn't really want to go that route with Vernon. I mean, obviously, there would be some, you know, nutty things that we'd be talked about, but it's way too profound to concentrate on things that we can get at a later date in regards to him. So, I mean, yeah, just an I absolute think, legend of the sport. Yeah, I, I think you did the right thing, Guy, in the interview only because, you know, I I don't I, – I nobody likes the fun stories more than me. Like, you know, like I still remember, you know, like, you almost went to the next fight on the Alex Steibling interview – and I was like, wait, 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 there's a story about him leaving Venezuela. I love those stories. I love the crazy yeah. stories. But I think you're right in that we can go all crazy stories with Vernon, and what will be forgotten is that the dude was a serious martial artist. Yes. And, yes. and, and I think what messed him up more than anything is that, that weird loyalty that guys like Ken inspire. You know, you don't know why people – Put up with that, but it is a loyalty that even now he sends. You get the sense that he has some some reverence for him. So it's interesting. That's you know that's why Ken is Ken. Ken is a, a huge personality, a huge ego, a huge everything. Everywhere he walks, he, he's usually the type A. You know, so so I, I'm not going to call him a mutual friend, but Ken and I have somebody that is very open with me. And he's not real close with Ken, but he really knows Ken. He's been around him many, many times. And he told me, like, this is literally what he said. He said, um, if Ken wasn't the lion's den, he probably would have been a cult leader. Like, he just attracts people that are just drawn to him, followers. You know, he's like, he doesn't have friends he's got. He's, well, Scott Pisack even said it as well to a certain degree. You know, he doesn't have friends. He's got followers, you know, in the Basak interview. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ken's an interesting take. You know, all, all all signs point to, like, a really rough childhood. That's what, you know, I'm sure he's got a book that, you know, he may have talked details. So, like, I'm not familiar with them, but all signs were, you know, he's, he was with you know home for wayward boys and stuff. And, you know, he was blessed with genetics. You know, he was oh, so sure. So the you know, it's a very interesting situation with Ken. And Ken yeah. Ken becomes one of those definite guys that with everything going on, if he had avoided the, the drugs and the partying, which is almost impossible to avoid, but if he had avoided it, then maybe he could have been talked about like as one of the all time greats, like you know, top, you know pound for pound guys at the time and stuff. And he seems to be forgotten in those conversations. Yeah. Well, with Vernon also, when there was questions where he, we needed an opinion, like he didn't have direct knowledge. He was just like, well, you know, I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know. I didn't see it. I don't remember. The only things that we got out of Vernon were things that he was directly involved in. And, and I respect that. Like he's not, he's not commenting on things he doesn't know about. Like we, we've had people on the podcast that, you know, they're, they're really loose with their facts, you know? Uh, and uh, he's definitely not that guy. Like if the cops come to your door, 
looking for somebody, you want him answering. Yeah, no, I, I I think Vernon is is that. I think he was a straight up guy. I think the Lions yeah. did he look for that as a face. You know, you can send him. You got like the, the positive guy, and then you know Ken is is the. And then here's the other part of it too: is is that they all got you know a little bit more money, maybe a little bit more travel with the UFC, with some other places, maybe something like that. But Vernon didn't, which I you know I think that that translates to like. Ken bought his guys in, and he was like, "Yeah, just pay him. You don't have to pay them. Pay me." And you know, I think, I think that that was also what was most important to Ken—the partying and also, you know, keeping his lifestyle going, which requires a lot of money. So, ladies and gentlemen, please like, share, subscribe. Okay, guys, we're not growing. We're not growing. You have to like. You have to share. You have to subscribe. If you don't do this, other people can't listen to it. Miguel, love you, brother. I got a kid ready to have a breakdown. Why don't you close this one out? And uh, we got Vernon White in the books. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.